Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, November 15th regular meeting of the school committee. I would ask everybody who's here in the room to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we have a pretty packed budget tonight, uh, sorry, meeting tonight with budget discussions. So anybody who's at home who would like to follow along, you can find our agenda materials on the website, the district website, if you go to the school committee tab. So we are going to uh, start tonight, and we do not have members of the student council, so we're going to go a little bit out of order, and we're going to start with uh, arts and music budget presentations. Is that, did I get that right? Yes. So Colleen, if you want to. Welcome. Hello. It's nice to see you both. Too. All right. I'm going to go alphabetically here. All right, first. All right. Can you hear me? All right. So I think most of you know who I am. Colleen Janino, visual art subject matter leader. Um, so for next year's budget as a whole, the art department district-wide um, is asking for an increase of approximately $2,268. Um, we have an increase in funds at the elementary level and the high school level. When speaking with the elementary principals about the budget for next year, we've discussed how we need to accommodate for the increase in the student population and look at the budget with a per-student lens. Therefore, at Elmwood, we've requested an increase of $213. At Marathon Elementary, we're looking to incorporate kindergarten art into the schedule. Currently, art is not offered to kindergartners. Um, to accommodate for this, the Marathon principal will be seeking an increase in FTE of 0.5, and we are looking to increase the art supply budget by $1,804. So this increase includes a new supply budget for kindergarten, as well as a slight increase for the first grade that's already being serviced, again, to to accommodate that increase in population. At Hopkins, we had already accounted for an anticipation, so the budget will be um, staying the same, anticipating that the population stays the same. At the high school, we are requesting an increase of funds of $533. These increases were spread out over a variety of line items, and they range from replacing broken light boxes, increasing costs of general consumable supplies for all of our courses, and replacing and ma maintaining worn tools and equipment. So some of that is our 3D printing, tools like pliers, drill bits, and rehabbing our 18-year-old manual 35 millimeter cameras. Um, I do have to say that as a department, we continue to supplement when possible with donations um, from parents and community organizations. Um, we're extremely conscientious of utilizing the tech bids, seeking out the lowest prices for, you know, what we can get for, <laughs> for a little amount of money. Um, we um, have utilized systems in our classrooms to minimize waste. We're constantly looking for grants to write, et cetera. Um, I'm going to circle back to kindergarten just a little bit. Um, if anyone has any questions, just let me know. But I do want to let you know that historically we have not had kindergarten in the uh, kindergarten art in the schedule um, kindergarten has been full day now for a few years and we still have yet to catch up to this so um, in speaking with Jen and other communities around us um, we recognize we are an outlier in this so I had reached out to Framingham Dover Sherborne Marlboro Northboro Southboro Westboro Menden Upton Holliston and Hopedale, all of whom offer kindergarten art. Some offer it to even the half-day kindergartners, some offer it to pre-K. So I hope we can finally service our youngest, most excited population um, and sort of fill that missing link that we have. If anyone has any questions. So did you mention the middle school? Um, the middle school, we do not have any increases. Mm -hmm. And sorry, is this increase based on the projected student population for next year? The kindergarten increase, we, we currently do not offer. It's the only related arts okay. that the kindergartners do not receive. 
so it's just not in the schedule. So $1,800 of that would be for a kindergarten supply budget, and then the kindergarten principal will be asking for an increase of 0.5 FTE. Okay. I don't think I was clear. It's okay. For which I apologize. Okay. All right. Um, are you taking into consideration the projected number of students we're supposed to have come into the for, district over the next 12 months? For kindergarten? No. Oh, for everything. Everything. Yes, we're, we're trying to the best okay. that we can. Yes, right. yes. And so you, you just want $2,000? I'm just a yes. little gobsmacked. Mm -hmm. we're, <laughs> we're not a huge department, and I think that um, part of what I was trying to say is we have been able to, to do a lot with what we have. Um, and, um, you know, we service elementary school right now, Marathon Art Teacher Services, the entire first grade. Hopkins, the entire school. Elmwood, the entire school. Middle school, the entire school. And at the high school, we service 60% of the population. So. Can I just ask about that mm -hmm. in terms of what that looks like? When we, um, obviously we're seeing a ton of new kids come in, and I just feel like these teachers tend to teach a class at a time, right? So if there are 24 kids, that's their art class in mm -hmm. the elementary level, is that right? Or they don't combine classes? Or no, they the have, the middle school is a little bit different with the team approach, but the elementary, elementary it's I mean. whatever their class teacher size is, you know, so they'll take, um, while the teacher would have a prep, a class would go to art or music or PE. So for both of you, I mean, how are you, how are those teachers feeling with all these new kids? I mean, is it, are we at a stress point or is it a reasonable level of students per one teacher and number of classes per teacher? I feel like we just keep adding kids mm -hmm. and I don't know that we're adding too many new classrooms, but still with art in particular and all the little hands and this art supplies and it's a lot I would, say, I would I would be lying if I didn't say it's a lot I mean they see the whole population it's different than being a classroom teacher in that respect so um, they're also the elementary teachers are all part-time so they're seeing the entire school on a part-time schedule so does it change the content that they that they're able to deliver I don't or do think they, so are they, able to continue? Um, they are able to continue I just think that it's um, you know maybe expectations are different in term I, it, I don't want to say expectations are different because they hold themselves to high expectations um, but the more we put on their plate you know, the more students they get, that's more students they they have to assess and more things they have to prep for and yeah, I would I imagine. I think the, the teachers are doing a very good job of using what equipment they have and spreading it out as far as they can. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, will we get to a breaking point? Probably. <laughs> but I know in watching the music classes that um, there's a lot of sharing, so okay. we'll set up a certain amount of instruments and one group will do one side, one group will do the other, so everyone gets a chance. May not all be at the same time, but you know, they're they're working around the increased population. Colleen, um, you know, even last year you did the same. It almost seems magical in the face of all the growth yes. that you managed to, you know, figure out a way to keep this minimal. I'm very excited that you're introducing art to our earliest learners. I think it's very, very important. Thank you. Um, so great job there. Um, last year you spoke very uh, emotionally and passionately mm -hmm. about the ceramics program at the high school. Um, why don't we see that ask? Um, I would love for that position back. I have not had that conversation with the administration. Um, you know, we're servicing the same amount of students. We're trying to still offer some sections of that, but what that means is my other teachers have um, made those sacrifices. We've dropped other classes. Um, you know, there's only so much we can control with the schedule too. So we have the numbers, kids elect the classes. We know that they're interested in them, but there's just maybe <laughs> not enough space, not enough teachers to teach them. Um, we have ideas for new courses, but um, that certainly, losing FTE sort of derailed us a bit last year, so I'm just trying to recover from that. Right. I, I guess I'd like to see your ambition mm -hmm. 
for the program overall, K through 12, emerge. You know, at no, I, to me personally, of course, I speak for myself, not the entire committee. I think what you do is extremely important. Um, to me, it's on equal footing with math and science. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to see the ask more ambitious. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, in, also just to piggyback of, off of what you said, the, any positions that are being added for either of your departments come through the building, each building's budget. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. So the marathon increase will come under the marathon budget, yes. for example. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I, I also, I should, I didn't, did you have anything more you wanted to add? No. Okay. no. I share yeah. the enthusiasm to see art brought down to the kindergarten level in the art space they have there that we had the chance yes. to see over the summer before the building opened is incredible. Also commend you on how you have been able to pull things together and such a low increase when you're continuing to add so much value to the district. Our arts programs, and I know you haven't had a chance to pre present, but music as well, I would include in that, are second to none in any district around here and add so much to so many students, but in particular students who maybe, that's, that is their passion. That's, they find that instead of a sport or instead of a particular something else, and also those who find the passion in addition to other stuff. So thank you for thank you. all of that. Thank you. I just add one. Do you mind if I add one okay. thing? Um, well, you talked about the passion, and so I think that our SMLs are, in some cases, coming in very conservatively because people are trying to be very fiscally responsible. But I did want to note that we were in a budget meeting today, and I heard administrators talk very positively about the passion, and I don't think they use the word passion, but about the impact that Colleen has had on the art program district-wide. Some of our curriculum le leaders are really secondary, but hers happens to be K through 12. Yeah. So even though you may not see some of it in this very brief moment in a school committee meeting, I think our administrators and our teachers are really happy with um, the support that they're getting in the art program, um, pre, pre K through through twelve. Right. No, I I don't think that I have any doubt on. Yeah, uh, just good to work. hear that that's oh, what the colleagues are saying too. Yeah, and we see that you know every time I walk down um, the hallway to get to this meeting, I al almost stop to watch what's on display. There's a, this beautiful pottery out there today, and some pinwheels. Mm -hmm. That's from our Fab Lab course, which is our 3D fabrication course. Yeah. So there's no doubt, just to yes. clarify on the work that's being done, it's amazing. Yeah, no, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Is any more questions? No? Okay. You're up. Uh, I'm Craig Hay, uh, music subject matter leader, K through 12. Um, and as we present budget, you know, this year we've done the same thing as, as Colleen. We've tried to come in low. In fact, we came in 1% under from the previous year. Um, we did take some things out of the budget that were more wants than needs. Uh, we wanted some additional chairs. We wanted a Barry Sachs for the middle school. But we felt at this time it was probably a greater priority to keep the budget low and we'll deal with what we, the equipment that we have. Um, one of the priorities of the music department is to oversee our, our school-owned instruments. We've been very lucky that over the last uh, what, nine months, uh, Andrew Keeley has started sort of an instrument donation program. We've received over a dozen high, great quality instruments that we have in kids' hands already. Um, and we've been able to purchase the last few years some great instruments for both middle school and high school bands and orchestras. Um, so while we've been able to purchase many instruments as well, we still have some high maintenance costs that are sort of outweighing the value of some of our older instruments, um, some of those instruments that have been around since the high school was on Main Street. Um, so we've been working very carefully with our uh, music company, David French, um, to keep them together as long as we can. Um, an additional priority of, our mu of the music department right now is um, not necessarily a performance-based one, but is just to update our technology throughout the, throughout the district. We're very lucky now that we have the Music Room in Marathon, which has incredible technology, which uh, Mrs. Moran is using uh, and just giddy about. Um, but we'd like to be able to do that throughout the entire district. And we're trying to basically switch everything from analog to digital. 
Um, uh, so we're very happy now that we've been able to do a lot of that at the, with the middle school auditorium. Uh, we're in the process. We have a new digital mixer um, now here at the high school, uh, so we can actually record up to, if we had enough microphones, 32 tracks um, to, to really listen in on, on the students if we wanted to do it that way. But one of the big issues that we do have coming up, and just to sort of keep uh, an eye out in the future, is all of our wireless microphones that we use for the musical that if you just went and saw the first performance of Godspell, you would have heard. Um, unfortunately, are un in frequencies that are being sold by the FCC uh, to uh, digital television. So uh, we've already started talking with uh, Ashok um, and talking with our music association and maybe getting a presentation ready for the HPTA because we're going to have to replace that entire system um, within the next two years probably. So we're working, working on that. Um, and just a, a few other things. Um, from last year to this year. Uh, for this year, we ended up having to um, reorganize the music department a little bit, and we did lose some FTE. So currently, Caitlin McDonald is now at uh, the middle school covering both band and orchestra full time, and Cat O'Toole was moved to the middle school to serve as just point eight orchestra. Um, once again, you know, looking ahead and knowing how many students have been moving into the district and um, we may have to be asking for more FTE to for increased class sizes. Uh, we'll work with the principals on that as you know we add more classes to each and every building. Um, so just in conclusion, I just wanted to say um, thank you to the school committee, Dr. Cavanaugh, Ms. Parsons, um, for both Colleen and I. Just you know the support that you give us to have a great and vibrant art and music program is just tremendous, and you know we are very lucky and very happy to to keep help working to build it and to make it even better so thank you uh, do you have any questions you guys rock <laughs> <laughs> really you do I think you do some of the most important work here because you. you teach to students who may not learn as easily in traditional ways um, but can fully express themselves through art and music and that's an immeasurable bit of it. Gobsmacked is right. Yeah. I, um, I mean, the arts program was a distinguishing characteristic of this district that brought us here. And, um, you know, love it. Love the music. You know, we're closer to the music department in my family. But um, I would echo Mina in encouraging you to ask for what you think is educationally sound, required. I mean, you guys are phenomenal about seeking um, support from the our other organizations grants and so forth but you know if we need microphones I mean there's sort of things that we just need and there are probably people that we need and I would like to make sure that those asks are in the hopper we're not can't guarantee we can do them but I would like to see them because I I think a lot of us value what you do and if we don't know about them we don't know what we're giving up so I hate to, to think you're just not even putting it forward if you think it's really needed so mm -hmm. I encourage you to um, you know really let us know where we're stumbling both with equipment and with people. Yeah. Yeah, lo love, love all the work that you do. I hear great things even from middle school students, uh, how much they're enjoying. Um, um, how is Mrs. Diamond doing? Are you in touch with her? She is fine right now. She is enjoying some just quiet time. <laughs> <laughs> great, thank you. Thank you both so much for coming out on a very cold night. Thank you. Thank you. Fingers crossed it does not snow. <laughs> now, right? If you can get out here right now. Thank, Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Then uh, next up, we're going to take Dr. Zaleski. Is that yes. out of order? Her commute's a little longer than Mr. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I think this was a surprise like, to Mr. Wait. Gosh. <laughs> she got here early for a reason. <laughs> Snow is coming. Sure is. <laughs> Good evening.
So I put my executive summary up for folks to review. It was, I believe it was in your packet, but um, I'm just going to start with a basic overview. So this year, my well, for FY20, my budget uh, does reflect an increase of $330,000,555 from the FY19 budget. And um, overall, the budget increase is 13%. Primarily, these increases are due to salaries and the expenses, which I'll speak to in a moment. When you look at the salaries in my personnel summary, it's a 500, just about a $500,000 increase due to some new positions I'm going to request tonight, as well as step lane changes and negotiated increases, um, as well as the positions that we did add in FY19, which was the FY19 to 20 adjustment. Um, so total three hundred fifty-five thousand um, dollars. The cost of the positions are, that are requested. When you look at the adjustments, these are things that have already been approved by the school committee that were brought forward to support student needs. So essentially, it was four paraprofessionals, total of three at the Marathon School and one at the Middle School. The new positions tonight that I'm going to request are multiple paraprofessionals across the district. Um, I'm just going to quickly go down each one to, to give you an overview in terms of why the asks. So at the high school, I'm asking for an ABA paraprofessional. We have students that are attending our Framingham State University program, and there's a requirement that you need to have a certain number uh, ratio of students to paraprofessionals. And in order to allow all students to have this opportunity, we need to be able to support them out in the community. Um, otherwise, we have to make a choice between who can go and who can't go. And truly, we want them to have that higher ed learning experience. I am requesting a learning specialist at the high school. So in, in examining caseload data, myself and Mr. Bishop and Michael Donahue went through and we assessed all the students coming up from eighth to ninth grade. And we have just about an entire caseload of students coming up, meaning about 14, well, it was 14 students at our initial assessment. Most recently, it's about 18 now. And with their current existing caseloads fluctuating between um, some some learning uh, learning specialists have 17, some have in the 20s, 24, 25. To add another entire caseload to their already existing caseloads is troublesome. And so I am requesting this position to support this, the transition from eight to nine and to be able to adequately meet their needs per the IEP. I'm also asking for a 0.5 nurse at the high school. So with the number of students we have attending our high school, there is a compliance concern and a safety concern. So the compliance concern is when you're over 750 students, you really should have more nursing support. Um, that is in the regulations, and um, that was also brought up in the NEASC discussion. So a separate of regulation, student safety is of utmost concern, and we want to make sure we have adequate support at the high school in the event that students need medical attention or intervention or just ongoing care for their current existing treatment plans. I am also asking for um, two paraprofessionals at the Hopkins School. So one is an ABA paraprofessional to support intensive special needs students um, existing. We are, so with all the student move-ins, when students move in, we recognize who's intensive and who's moderate and what their needs are, but we don't know the extent of their needs until we get to know the student. So we have IEPs in front of us that may not necessarily call for this immediately, but as we're getting to know the student body and their needs are growing, um, where we need to be thoughtful in our planning. And so that is why I'm requesting the um, both the intensive and the moderate. The moderate specifically um, is for students not necessarily due to move-ins, but we have students right now that are in our intensive programs that we're diligently working with to provide instruction to, and we're stepping them down into the moderate program so they can be more in the inclusive environment and be successful. But it's difficult to make that transition if you don't have paraprofessional support, to go from an intensive environment into the general inclusive environment without that layer of support is, is not a healthy transition because the students are going to need some layer of support. So we're requesting that to help with that transition. And to, it does increase independence in the environment and exposure to the curriculum across the across the um, grade spans. Um, also, we're requesting a paraprofessional at the middle school. This is a, uh, and also an ABA para. We have uh, three identified students. Actually, they're coming up from the, um, 
Popkin School into the middle school, but with the existing supports that we have at the middle school and these three students who have been identified as needing these, this level of care, um, we definitely need that layer of support as well. The point three TVI is um, an a definite an FY20 request, and I don't I don't know if it's okay for me to incorporate. I have an FY. It's also on the agenda tonight. I figure while we're talking about if I can talk about it together, because F because right now I have an immediate need. Is that okay? is that okay with you folks? Okay. So so TVI is teacher of the visually impaired, and so she has a caseload of students that she's servicing that have um, significant conditions that are being continuously monitored by their um, health care providers. And um, through a recent examination of their needs, it's come to our attention that they need um, increased layer of support. So not just because she's a direct care provider, but for, for instance, um, and I, in the interest of protecting student confidentiality, I'll just speak in general terms. We have students who, um, because their impairment is progressing, need specialized equipment, and they're learning how to do Braille, for instance, whereas last year they didn't have to learn that level of, of um, intervention. So what that means for the teacher of the visually impaired is when they have to learn new equipment, not only does she have to keep them up and in, in performing, and these students, by the way, are very high performing students, um, but to keep them you know, in their AP courses and doing well. She's training them on the interventions, but she's also training them on the new equipment. And the students have the motivation. I mean, they're doing a really great job. Um, fantastic, actually. And, but she needs the time to do it. So in the past, we could easily use paraprofessional support to like enlarge materials. But because this equipment is so specialized, the paraprofessionals cannot do it. So I'm requesting tonight an immediate point three increase, which I will um, offset in my current budget out of contracted services. Last year, when I came before the committee, I budgeted extra money in my contracted services for exactly needs like this, and unanticipated needs. So I do have the funds to cover that this year, so we can immediately start having her her do that. Um, and then I want to just keep it in the budget for the FY20 because these students are still going to be with us and still have this ongoing need into next year. Um, and then a point one out of district increase. So our out of district numbers have uh, drastically increased and uh, largely this year it's due to student move-ins who are, who are in placements. There's no budget in impact to this ask, just to let folks know, because I am going to recommend a decrease of the, of the psychologist at the Elmwood School. So just to help you understand how it works, and that's a little bit later on, but I'll speak about it while we're talking about this. We have a 1.0 personnel who is servicing both as our out of district coordinator and our Elmwood School psychologist. And at the Elmwood School, she's doing testing and some counseling intervention. When I met with her and um, Ms. Carver, the building principal, we looked at the caseload, we looked at the testing volume that she's doing, and then we also looked at her, um, Aunt Ms. Carver's other supports at the Elmwood School, which include school adjustment and full time guidance in a BCBA. We felt very well equipped to easily make this 0.1 decrease of, of the psychologist presence in the building to support the 0.1 increase of the out of district. So that it's, it's, it's okay. Students are still going to get a, a range of services at the, at the Elmwood School, social emotionally, but I definitely have to have increased time in out of district because right now I have 34 students sitting in placements with it array of needs and it's across the state. Um, our, when our out of district coordinator has a team meeting, she often sometimes has to travel two hours to, to some of these programs and then the meetings take two hours and then it's commuting back. Um, and it's not even because the placement is two hours away, it's traffic. I mean, some of these programs are out far away. I mean, they're out east, they're down the Cape. I mean, it's just traffic. So we need, we need the time. Um, I also am asking for a point two increase of secretarial support, both at the pre-K level and in, and in my office. So at the pre-K level, it's primarily due to the volume of uh, EIs that we have. EI means early intervention students pouring into our marathon school. Last year, um, we looked at I looked at the um, assessment assessments that we did. We did 75 assessments coming in from early intervention with our team chair, and the team chair 
is doing all of the you know assessments with the with the other related service providers but on top of that she's trying to manage and monitor the paperwork and it's overwhelming I mean it's really overwhelming so um, we had to ha even have her do some summer hours with us to catch up it's just so to avoid that and properly plan and prepare I'm asking for the point to increase at the pre-k I'm also asking for point two of my secretarial support in my office. So due to the volume of student enrollees out of district placements and the number of requests that come in from families for a range of things, whether it's um, student records, legal reasons, we, um, we definitely need the help. How we're doing it right now is we're, we're trying to pull from um, building-based secretarial support to have them come in and help us with things that we are struggling to get to ourselves, which is filing record keeping and things like that um, but again with the volume of requests that are coming through my office I think this makes sense to help just stabilize it because I I don't want to keep pulling from the building level because so many students have moved in and there's so many needs at the building level um, so it's, it's getting trickier as time is passing so I just put a summary statement here um, about the new asks Again, and just to repeat a little bit what I said, the position, paraprofessional positions are really designed to support student move-ins, unanticipated needs, the intensive to moderate shifts in the 18 to 22 program, which is students going out to Framingham State University. The high school learning specialist is designed to support the 14 additional s students, excluding the move-ins. The teacher of, vi of the visually impaired just supports the growing needs across the district. The out of district supports the student move-ins in students and placements, and then the secretarial supports increasing requests in the servicing the early intervention population. I always like to align it to something in the strategic plan, and you know, to continue our culture of continuous imp improvement and high expectations. I feel like these positions will support our continued efforts here in Hopkinton. So the reductions that I'm presenting tonight. I am proposing to reduce a point four learning specialist at the middle school. So last year we requested a point four learning specialist as we were working to um, begin our bright program, our social emotional program, and we needed this point four to help cover some caseloads of our existing learning specialists in order to successfully implement that program. So we have successfully begun to implement that program, but with that, um, what I've realized in examining caseloads from Elmwood coming into, I mean, I'm sorry, not Elmwood, Hopkins into the middle school, we are able to comfortably next year support with our school adjustment counselors and our clinical staff that Bright program and using one of our special educators, and I can reduce that position. So we are able to continue our programming and comfortably reduce that position based on the caseload. At Elmwood School, a uh, reduction of 1.9 paraprofessional. So I call it a reduction because of the number of paraprofessionals they have right now, but that it's not really a reduction. Those students are just shifting up. They're shifting up into the into Hopkins. So some of these paraprofessionals are, are being shifted. So when you look at all the shifts across the district, although Elmwood will be down 1.9, it they're adequately staffed in those those paras will be moving into the Elmwood School to support the students as they're moving up. And then the 1.0 special education coach. So we hired last year a grade two to five special education coach to service students um, in both the Elmwood and Hopkins School to examine curriculum alignment. Although this is a, a critical position to support students, um, my concern right now with the number of students that we have it, that have moved into the district the direct care and support that is needed to them at the building level to me is essential. I would love to keep this position, but honestly, I feel like at this point, it's a luxury that we can't afford. And direct care has to be the primary focus right now of students getting instruction in the classroom from highly qualified learning specialists. Um, so that's the reason for that reduction. So just to finalize my expense summary, the tuitions, the budget reflects the increase in tuitions. This is due to the out-of-district out of placements, the move-ins, and then we also have a rate increase um, we get from the providers. So we plan for a 3% rate increase of the tuition. So the total in that is 237000 <clears throat> and that's just as of right now. I, I have a student right now who's also a move-in that's in a pending placement, so this number is going to go up, but for now, as of today, that's what the number looks like. Transportation, um, 
reflects an increase of five hundred seventy thousand dollars, and then fifteen thousand in the homeless transportation costs. And it part of that's the FY nineteen budget transfer of the prepaid transportation salaries and the costs of personnel hired. Um, we also have like van monitors and things that's incorporated into that cost. And the remaining increase of two hundred forty thousand reflects uh, the the transportation ass assessments. And finally, assistive technology, um, there is a $10,000 add-on I put into our, our budget to support students' needs. So for instance, when I, I have a student yeah, either move in or an existing student needs something like a Braille reader, it's very costly, and I want to properly plan for it and have it in the, embedded in the budget. So when we're getting those medical reports from the providers, I don't have to scramble and worry about how we're going to cover that cost. So we're being thoughtful with that ask at this moment. Thank you. I know it's a lot. And, ju and just to preempt a little bit, um, so as you know, at the last school committee meeting, we presented kind of that first round of asks, which came in at 9.9, .9, which we knew was just kind of, this is where we are, and we we will now begin working with all departments. So, you know, Colleen and Craig, Dr. Zaleski, and people that are presenting tonight have already been given that task of, we can't do 9.9. .9. Mm -hmm. So that's where you see some of these cuts, um, you know, because they've had to go back under the directive of what can we do to bring this number down. And right. so that's where you see some of these things that are hard choices, mm -hmm. um, but that Dr. Zaleski is putting forward, and you'll see a little bit of that with the others as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what is being presented? Um, will ultimately be lower than 9.9 .9 because that was the preliminary high level so what's being presented now should bring it down already yes okay um i had a couple questions for you first i totally appreciate your flexibility and agility and mm -hmm. trying to adapt all these new numbers no thank you um all these kids with needs coming into mm. our schools and they need our support. So I am concerned about the special education coach position being removed. Okay. Um, because even before we had this explosion in student population, mm -hmm. we had some real literacy needs mm -hmm. in the elementary years that I fear will now go by the wayside. And you, you talk about direct care, and I get it, Dr. Zaleski. I, I totally sure, get it. Right. But you know, direct care is also reading and writing. Mm -hmm. Um, they have to be able to know how to do these things to navigate mm -hmm. the system. So I'm a little concerned about that. I also know you have been inundated by trying to f reconfigure the whole system and supporting these students. So you probably haven't been able to get much thought to a kind of longer term plan about what we do here. We have over 34 students out of district. Mm -hmm. What can we do to try to keep some of them in mm -hmm. district? How can we restructure the program? Um, if I can speak to that. So our out of district coordinator, her and I meet constantly. And so we do, I will say, we do a very good job of returning students. We've returned over the past, this is now my fourth year, but over the, t the time that I've been here, we've returned several students annually. Um, but with special education and student move-ins and unpredictable factors, it's hard to it's hard to really see the offset of that because as we're returning students, the next day students are moving in in their placements. Um, so it's it's constantly a push and pull with the out of districts. Um, I th I think some of the things too is you know we look at the the you know disability criteria. We look at how they're faring in the programs. We're constantly analyzing data in the programs through the, the programs themselves. We get all their progress monitoring reports. Um, our out of district coordinator goes out and she's having um, doing conducting observations, meeting with the staff there constantly to find out the stability level of these students and whether or not they're ready for return. We also do a lot of step downs, meaning students that are in private placements, we step down to collaboratives and then we look for them to potentially return when we're able to have them return. But a lot of them aren't ready to return, and that is just a reality. Given their stability level, sometimes it's due to their age range and needing to learn some new skills. And then the other factor is when students do move in that are in existing placements, we are responsible, and until we get to know the students, it's hard to make a determination to return them until we know them. And we have to know how they're faring in the placement. Some of them, 
may have even been in the placement for longer periods of time, but they're typically, when we look at the data from the other districts and their IEPs and we speak to the programs, they're still in there for a reason because they're not doing well. Um, or they haven't learned a skill. It's not always that they're not doing well. They may not have all the skills that they need to return to the public school environment. Um, and I say public school environment, just for clarification, collaborative is public school. It's considered public day school. It's an extension of our district. So um, we are working diligently, and I think I, I would love to have all the students return, but we need to have the programs to be able to effectively have them return. And that's part of the reason uh, for my working across the district to try to build the, our social-emotional programs, because there's a portion of our students that are sitting in placements that have social-emotional needs, and if we have adequate programs, we don't have to send them out anymore. And we can also work to return them, but if nothing's built, we can't do that. So that's the other tricky part about this. Um, but I absolutely hear you, Ms. Tyler. I, you know, I share your, your concern in terms of 34 students out of district. This is their you know, hometown. This is their district. Um, it would be fantastic to have these kids back and here and receiving all the care that they're receiving in the placements and be successful. Yeah, because I think be great. the families feel kind of exiled from the community, too, mm. um, unfairly. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that we should consider carefully changing our program so these mm -hmm. students who need extra support can come back in. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard any conversation about reducing the size of the classrooms. Mm -hmm. So say you can get students who have autism, who are overwhelmed by the sensory environment, they can go into a smaller classroom, mm -hmm. like the Nest program in New York City, which has been incredibly successful mm -hmm. in supporting those students. Mm -hmm. Um, I really think I'd love to see some structural changes mm -hmm. because otherwise I see the, the cost of this just going up sure. exorbitantly year by year. I don't see, you know, physical changes taking place to allow these kids to come back in. They, I mean, they're forced to come back into a class of 24. Right. And you know, that may never work for them. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do to welcome them, them back into the community and reconnect their parents with other parents? Mm -hmm. Point, point taken. And I think we can further the conversation. I th yeah, well, I've, I've made this point several times mm -hmm. over a number of years now, and I'm, I really would love to see some gargantuan effort going into bringing these kids back into mm -hmm. the community. Mm -hmm. I just I had a second question, follow up question on the out of district placement. Sure. Um, does the 34 students include uh, students that we are not able to, in addition to the, you know, the Framingham? state program that we do work with, but does it include students in the 18 to 22 population who are not able to have their needs met in our community that go or placed out someplace else? Oh, yes, if they were. But our 18 to 22 students, yes, we have students in the out of district placement. And that's, that are, is that counted in 34? That, that is. Or is that yes, that is. Okay. That is. But our 18 to 22 program that are going out to Framingham State, those students are still in, in district. district. Right, yes, that's and they I, are just out and going about in the community. Yep. Yep. But so I, I guess tagging on to some of what Meg was saying, I know that there had been some talk when we were looking at the center school reuse about doing something a little bit different, mm -hmm. potentially with the 18 to 22 program that might, uh, it, it's unfortunately not next year, but might offer better programmatic opportunities for our 18 to 22 population. We would love to do that. To be in. Uh, we would love to do that. If, if you recall, a couple of years back, we wrote a grant and we tried to purchase a site and we ran into multiple barriers to allow the students to be off-site and have better opportunities in the community and better exposure. Um, if we could have the center school for reusage to rebuild something, I would be very excited to join that initiative. And then one more, I'm sorry, no, one more question there. related to out of district in, re, with regard to circuit breaker money, because my understanding of the circuit breaker money was it, that it, the <laughs> percentage of reimbursement has increased. And mm -hmm. I know last year we saw a large number of students increased. As it appears we have a large mm -hmm. increase in out of district placements. But will some of that increased circuit breaker money that we'll get for students mm -hmm that we're currently paying for this year offset some of the increases that we're paying out for next year, or is that already considered into that number? So I'm going to ask Susan to speak about that, because she's got really the specific details on that. Right. So the circuit breaker has already been figured in to the budget. Um, 
you'll recall last year part of our budget struggle is the year prior to that so FY 18 we were using about 600,000 of circuit breaker money our receivable was only 300,000 yeah. so we were doubling down on draining that account so part of our budget struggle last year was reducing that from a 600,000 use of circuit breaker to 300,000 to more align with what we're getting in terms of a receivable. So with the changes in out of district and they did make changes in the reimbursement rate, um, we have a higher receivable, but we will be maintaining the level that is fiscally responsible sure so that number is already figured into dr. Zaleski's budget okay thank you um, dr. Zaleski the work that you do is extremely important thank you um, and um, you know in all the asks that you have here I, I have a couple of questions what's the assumption on the growth for next year because this year we saw a lot of requests middle of the year right related to paraprofessionals or what have you mm -hmm. so what's your underlying assumption of the growth so my underlying assumption is that we, to to your point, because we do come we come mid year. So one of the asks in here specifically, I feel like at the Marathon Elementary School is where we have students. We have we come to before the school committee the most for the the lower elementary level. So that that ABA pair at the Marathon School, based on the pre K prediction, and the the numbers that we looked at. And the continual ask that we're, we're coming before school committee for. We, we did less with the pre-K with the ask because we restructured pre-K. That was a, a structural change that we did make, which was helpful. But those students who have responded to that structural change for inclusive pre-K in, environment are now in K-1 and they're moving up. So we need to look at that change as well. So that para specifically to support students with intensive student needs is an unanticipated need paraprofessional to support that assumption that based on history and us coming before school committee and also the growing numbers pouring in from EI is going to support that effort. If we cut that out of the budget right now, we would be okay for the start of, new year, of the new year. But come October of next year, Lauren and I would be back here asking for you for a paraprofessional because it's just the history. So that that's my presu presumption. As far as the rest of the, po the positions go, we are well supporting ourselves with this with this configuration to support the existing students but this also allows us enough room to support incoming students as well because these paraprofessionals unless students have a one-to-one -one on their on their grid service more than one student at a time so right now these paras are going to service all the students that we currently know about but there's room at the other grade levels to service the students that may come in unless they come in with one-to-one -one supports. If they come in with one-to-one -one supports, then it's gonna be more tricky, but that is why I embedded that at the lower elementary, because one-to-one -one support typically is at the lower elementary. You can see it at the upper grade levels if it's not on, you know, if it's not off the grids, but usually when you, when you see it in that configuration, then you start talking about putting them in intensive classrooms with other types of adult supports if needed to increase independence in the learning environment. So I feel like this is a, a well-predicted budget for existing students that we know about that are going to be here next year and potential unanticipated needs. So you're feeling confident about these projections at the moment? I do. Okay. I do. Uh, the other question I have is last year during budget season, mm -hmm. uh, there was a request that came from you for professional development a little late. It was about $50,000. I'm wondering if there's room um, for you know any professional development that you have built in here? Um, any plans around that? I didn't build any plans around that. So the $50,000 professional development that I came before school committee with was um, a general education initiative to support special education in tiered intervention. Because we've, we're working through all of that right now in training staff with Wilson or in Gillingham, all the things that we spoke about last year, and we are following through on that, all the staff are being trained at the different levels. Um, we don't need to continue that effort. What we need to do is implement that effort. And so that's why I don't have a, a big ask like that for this year. Because I feel, unless people resign, which hopefully they don't, I feel like we're going to have people, well-trained people um, in our district to support the student needs. Um, the last question I have is a little bit for you and a little bit for Dr. Kavanaugh and Ms. Parson. Um, 
I've heard from some community members how wonderful uh, the support for children with special needs is. Um, this particular friend of mine who, is in, uh, who has a child in Elmwood speaks very highly of the support her child has received. Um, and I also hear some concerns, mm -hmm. um, you know, coming in from the CPAC parent group mm -hmm. talking about how their needs are not being met. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, of course, I've heard Professor Tyler talk about the NEST program. I think she came and spoke as a parent last year, and of course, now on the school committee. And I'm wondering, as we look at the strategic plan, you know, clearly some things are working and some things which require work. And I understand the pain that she talked about when uh, parents have to pull their, you know, whether out of district or what have you, when kids are not in their hometown studying in a school, you know, along with their peers in the community. It's painful. Mm -hmm. It's painful for the kids and the parents. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, what is the plan? Is it in, in the works as you look at the strategic plan to look at some alternatives, alternate models? Will there be some room um, for some kind of uh, piloting a program that might work and eventually not only bring the community closer, serve our children's needs? I know it's asking for a lot, but uh, you know, hopefully also reduce the costs eventually in longer term as we bring kids back into the district. So, well, I guess I will just speak to the transitions and then I'll obviously let the two of you speak to it too. So one of the conversations that we had at our budget meeting this morning is, so you imagine that we're putting bright programs into the Marathon Elementary School, the Elmwood School, and maybe eventually Hopkins. But what that means is you have the same three programs in three different buildings so you have to hire three adjustment counselors in three different buildings. What would be nice is if you had you know, more than two years in every single one of our buildings, then maybe you could have an autism program that was in one, two, three, four, five school, and that would be the school that you know, really built a beautiful program um, to service children who are diagnosed with autism. And then in the other two, three, four, five school, we might have a program that would work um, you know, for other students with different diagnoses. But right now, if you try to build programs, what you're doing is building multiple programs in multiple buildings at, in two-year stints. Mm -hmm. And I just think that that's sort of counterintuitive, I mean, fiscally and I even think programmatically. But um, because if I am a kid who gets very accustomed to my Bright program or autism program in my 2-3 school after two years and making that transition to another program that requires, you know, a reacclimation entirely, right? So there, there's just a host of reasons for me to think about those kinds of things. If we want to do them in fiscally responsible ways, I think we would probably want to look at, at different, I guess, configurations. Um, I'm not opposed to looking at those kinds of things. I just think now that we have to think about them um, in terms of you know what will it cost if, if you have an autism program and another program and another program in a physical plant that won't house three different rooms because we don't have the room in a physical plant. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, I So understand. I don't want to be the mistress of doom and gloom. I'm absolutely happy to look at those kinds of things. I just think we have to do it in a way that's sort of logistically sound too. Mm -hmm. sure. But I'm sure you probably have more to add to that. No, I, I agree with that. And what I'll add to that is when we look at our students in out of district placement, they vary in their disabilities. So it's it's. I don't want to mislead any folks thinking that if we built these programs, the, all these students would come back because we have many students in our district placements that do not fit into that criteria. Um, but programmatically speaking, let's put cost aside, but cost is important. But programmatically speaking, I do hear what you're saying because students that come into the district or that are in the district that do have that diagnosis that could benefit from a program, it could be very beneficial to prevent future placements. It's not a guarantee if we built a program that the current current students coming out would return, but autism is a very real diagnosis, and students are coming into our district every day with it, and students are being categorized with it as they're in our district. Um, from a long-range strategic plan, I think it would be a great idea, but again, there's a cost prohibitive factor, and we have to think about as a district what are what are the priorities um and that is definitely a deeper conversation for the i think for the central office team in terms of how would we how would we work that with the current configuration of our of our district and what does make the most sense and i'd love in further input on that quite frankly from cpac and from from folks i mean i'm, I'm not opposed to getting further input to brainstorming what what makes sense both from a cost perspective and a programmatic perspective 
And, you know, I, I really do appreciate the complexity of this situation, mm -hmm. and I, I know you've mm -hmm. both been thinking about it, and Dr. Kavanaugh's been thinking about it, but I worry when I hear cost prohibitive more than I hear, you know, free and appropriate education to students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we serve these kids more fully instead of putting them on a van with a stranger every morning, having them do an hour drive to a school that they're not familiar with, come back to a community in which they no longer have friends. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, we just need to have some frank conversations together about how to do this. And, you know, if it's cost prohibitive, well, I mean, everything is cost prohibitive. The salaries we give teachers are cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. They're enormous. Mm -hmm. So let's think about these kids and their distress in a daily way, and they're out of district placements, and they come back in, and they just don't have friends here. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they feel excluded, and they're teased, and what are we doing to help them along and give them the education that the law requires we give them? So if I can just add to that, and I, I don't disagree with anything that you're saying, but on the matter of free, appropriate public education, what we have a responsibility to do, and what I have a responsibility to do in my role, is if we don't have a program to support a student in an effort to provide them a free, appropriate public ed education, I have to place them. And so I don't want folks to be misled in thinking that we're not providing that. And I know that's not what you meant, but I just want folks who may be watching tonight who don't understand the process better understand that it is our obligation as an educational organization to provide all students with what they need. And if we don't have it, we have to offer something outside of what we have, which is definitely have, has a cost impact. But in the bigger scheme of thing, again, I'm open to working strategically, but it's going to have to involve multiple stakeholders. And we can figure out how to do that and further the conversation with Dr. Kavanaugh, with the CPAC group, to see what makes sense giving our current configuration in the current population of students, um, and then projections. I mean, it's hard to project when students come in district what their disability, what, what they're going to be categorized in terms, especially if they're initially being evaluated. Um, but we can look at our existing population and how we're servicing them in our intensive programs, matched against your knowledge of this program that you referenced, which is the, the NEST program. Yeah, and, and it's not just my knowledge. I mean, there's been a lot of evidence-based research mm -hmm. on it to talk about its success. I mean. Yeah, I'm just worried because I, I hear about cases, say, at Marathon, where they have a little room where if a kid is having a hard time, the kid goes into that little room, which is padded, and can go in there with a, another adult. Mm. Um, and the door can be open or closed, but there still seems to be a lock on that door. And I, I just, you know, it, it chills me to think of a kid having a big issue like that and having to go into this small room and why aren't we having larger conversations about how to support this kid mm -hmm. so this kid doesn't feel tremendous amounts of anxiety? Mm -hmm. um, because the anxiety is not originating in the heart of that child. The anxiety is originating in the environment in which that child might be found. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to think more carefully about how to place kids in our classroom who can stay in the district. Mm -hmm but not have it so overwhelming for them mm -hmm. that they have to go into a little room to calm down, to mm -hmm. quiet themselves. I'm not even sure what the current phrase is mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. But these are real concerns. Sure. So I'm just, I just want to be aware of time. I don't want to cut you off. But No, that's OK. Was, it's a good conversation. Yep, I mean, no, I, I do have a quick question, if the committee would allow. Um, do, do these numbers also include programmatic changes, improvements that have been discussed regarding ESY? These numbers do not include ESY. So my ESY budget is Separate. leveled. It's leveled and it's stable. And so we have enough room in my ESY budget. We've what I built last year, so yep. we had a cost savings last year in ESY um, in terms of the way that I managed that budget. So I predict, even with enroll enrollments and what we have um, you know, currently existing and what we know, students are still qualifying right now for ESY, but are based on our current numbers and then potential enrollments, we have plenty of room in my ESY budget to be able to support that. So this, there's no add-on here. I don't need additional asks for that. Um, I just need to keep what I have <laughs> to keep it going and keep it going well. Thank you. Can I ask one more quick one? Um, if you scroll down a little bit, this may just be an, an explanation. Um, it, it says transportation assessments. Mm -hmm. 
What, a, what is transportation assessments? Susan has the deeper details because she goes to all those meetings and accepts. So I'm going to let her yeah, talk it's about that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a big, a big one. Yeah. It yeah. is a big number. So we operate with a collaborative um, for our transportation through Accept Collaborative. Mm -hmm. And so what they do in an effort to make budgeting um, more stable for districts is they take the number of kids that we have going out of district, the distance that they're going, assign them points, you know, if they're just coming, you know, if they have transportation on their IEP but they're in district, you know, it's a low point, but if they're going, you know, say it's an hour drive, it's a high point. And then the cost for the transportation program of all the districts that are participating is then shared based on your students and your points. So a couple things happened for this assessment to go up so high. Um, one, which is a small piece, is the number of students that are using um, specialized transportation has increased. So that went up. Um, the number of people that are in the cohort that are sharing that assessment, one, what I'll call a, a market mover, is potentially dropping out. So a huge piece of the cost, fixed costs, were shared almost 50% by this one market mover. So right now, this is the worst case scenario. That district has not made final decisions, so this number could come down. It shouldn't go up. Okay. Um, so, but an assessment model, basically what that does is, as students move in and out and district and placements change all the time, your transportation's not doing this. It's just level. It's fixed based on the kids, and then they do that catch up in the year following. Okay. But this one is, is a big one. It's big. based on one of our cohorts potential decisions all right so we should call them huh <laughs> right. thank you right beg one request um it's more a future agenda item request i mean be, uh, knowing all the good work that goes on and hearing some of the concerns can we have a future agenda item where we talk a little bit more in depth about the programs we have uh, for the special needs uh, uh, sure. student population look at what's working look at what's not working and uh, which way you know where is the innovation where's the room for innovation mm -hmm. while being uh, cognizant of the costs what I would like to do too and I'll look at Ms. Tyler on this is to start that conversation in CPAC just to, to lay out the bones because we have a we have all of our program descriptions so I would really like that future agenda item to start with CPAC because then we can we can analyze what we have against parent understanding of the of what we have and then we can craft something together and then bring it before school committee for further discussion does that make sense absolutely absolutely does that make sense sure, sure. Before you go, I wanted to allow Mr. Manning, who is here from Appropriations, if you had any okay. questions or comments for Dr. Zaleski on her budget here. Yes, absolutely. And then I also would, while you're here, I, if we could jump ahead to, the, since you had discussed the TVI, it, yes. I would seek a motion, uh, and I'm going to read what I'm seeking motion for exactly. Uh, a motion for the, somebody on the school committee to approve the request for, of a point three for the teacher for the visually impaired. So moved. Second. second. So motion by Mina, second by Meg. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. And so that is so approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Zaleski. Presentation. Thank you so much. Safe drive. Yes, safe drive. It, it appears that it is snowing. Um, can you see it? You, you can see it from your seat. I can't see okay, it. Okay, I can. You gotta lean in this way a little bit. I happening huh? it, it is happening so with that we are going to I want to make sure I mr. Ghosh uh, for technology please so and again for people tuning in at home uh, who would like to look at some of the agenda materials to follow along this is on our district website under the school committee under today's agenda so welcome welcome Good thank evening. you
talk quickly about the uh, technology budget overview for FY20. Um, I think the, the budget um, this year is going to kind of still focus in on three areas. Um, the first priority for the district and the technology budget is to maintain a core operating system and infrastructure. Um, the current budget will level fund our maintenance account, which helps pay for all district repairs. In addition, the tech contracted service account also supports all renewals for all major services provided throughout the district. Uh, and some of this increase in FY20 uh, to this account is due to new social media archiving tools required by state law um, to keep track of public records and also for additional licenses needed for power school uh, for increased enrollment in other, other areas. Uh, the, the next area is really uh, looking at an increase of one FTE uh, to help fund a new webmaster position uh, for the district um, to help kind of maintain the district website and all the associated school pages. Um, currently, our, our technology staff does not have enough time to consistently update the website. Although we maintain the current website with relevant content, there are too many changing events and details that require a constant eye to keep up with. Uh, and then the last area is instructional technology, uh, which provides teachers and um, students access to digital resources and tools, improves differentiated instruction, and heightens engagement. The presented budget will continue to maintain the core equipment in classrooms. Uh, for example, we'll continue to support LCD projectors, document cameras, and student devices. Uh, and finally, the preliminary budget, as presented tonight, will support instructional software. Um, in the FY20 budget, there's a need for additional software licenses to support struggling learners, um, as kind of described below, and I'll get into that in, in a little bit. Um, the personnel summary, as mentioned, is uh, once again one FTE for a webmaster. Uh, that would be a rough increase of $80,000. Uh, depending on um, the placement and the position, um, that is an estimated budget item, but depending on who we can attract to that position, that may vary uh, as we move forward. Uh, in the expense summary, uh, the tech contracted services account, um, which is up about 7% or $18,000 uh, this year, is a result of additional licenses needed for PowerSchool and other district-wide software that we have. Um, the Power School did an audit recently uh, on our system. Uh, our previous licensing was based on around 3,400 students. As of yesterday, the enrollment in Power School was 3,746. So that's an additional 300 or so licenses there that will go up with Power School, and then another series of licenses will go, will go up as needed with that new enrollment. Um, AV accounts, we have AV accounts at each building. Um, they're pretty much level funded. Uh, there was a small increase of $500 at Marathon School uh, coming up to help maintain a larger building with more equipment. Um, the technology maintenance account is up about 6.7% or roughly $5,000. And this is the main account that fixes anything that's broken, computer parts, screens, anything that goes down gets repaired out of this account. Um, Overall instructional technology, um, this is kind of a, a brief summary of all the different schools, right? So each school has its own instructional technology account. I try to highlight some of the questions. Ashok, uh, is it possible to show uh, what you're talking about? Uh, yes, system, if Mario? I, as the technology director, could, could connect. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the Apple TV display went off, so I apologize for that. If I can get it going off. Screensaver is a mesmerizing. They never tell you which city that is, so we end up guessing. <laughs> Where is it? Sorry about that. Thank you. That's great. I was trying to go old school, just paper, pencil. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Can people see the screen, or is that too? A little bit bigger, perhaps? Or does it work f for Mr. Manning? You have a hard copy? Yes, you can have uh, I was going to say, I do too. Yeah, that's, Does that that's work? great. Okay. Yes, thank you. 
All right, so the technology maintenance, um, we talked about instructional technology, as I said, this is kind of highlighting the key areas where there were some increases. So this Hopkins is one, one instructional technology account, and I have a graph I can show you after, but is one area where there's an increase of 6.7%. Um, and that, that increase at Hopkins is due to the new Chromebook lease that was purchased this year, and that will continue next year. Um, the middle school is up because of a, the new Chromebook lease that started this year, uh, and then the middle school is up for a new teacher lease uh, starting um, in FY20. So those are the main increases um, in that account. Still, as you can see, um, you know, overall is, is down, right? So we're, we're up in those two areas, but overall, year to year, we're, we're down um, because of some of the other accounts uh, having leases that have dropped off. So even though we're adding still new equipment, we're down overall in those accounts. Uh, library accounts, for most part, are, are down. Uh, each each account has a, a library account, or each school has a library account that typically pays for the uh, library databases, OPALs. It's pretty consistent uh, in each building. Um, and there wasn't an increase this year on the renewal, so um, the, that account will actually be slightly down, uh, $786. Uh, not huge money. Uh, the next area, which is kind of up this year, is instructional software. Once again, I try to break it down per building. Uh, so Marathon School is up quite a bit um, because of additional students and because of uh, really the area of, uh, of Lexia uh, and, and a software tool that helps support literacy and reading. Um, because of uh, a decrease in numbers last year, jumping up to uh, the enrollment we're at, it's, it's quite a bit of an increase uh, at Marathon School. Elmwood is up as well in uh, licensing and software, primarily because of an increase in Lexia. We had identified some struggling, struggling readers uh, this year, um, and we needed to, to purchase and prepare to buy additional licenses to support those students. Um, Hopkins has a slight increase of 10%, 10.7% um, due to software. Uh, learning A through Z is another uh, learning support tool uh, utilized by special educators uh, in the buildings. Uh, middle school, uh, we did have uh, an increase in IXL and another software tool called iReady. Um, in IXL, we've added ELA. That was budgeted last year, so that's not a new ask for the middle school, but it's kind of transferred from you know, hopefully the middle school English department area to me. So I've now taken ownership of IXL for both ELA and math. Last year, it was just math. This year, it's math and ELA, thus the increase at the middle school. Um, Pre-K uh, has had a small increase of roughly 20%. Um, it's, a 20, it's a big percentage, but not a big dollar amount for an additional um, board maker license, uh, which helps special ed um, teachers and students. The last you know, kind of big account that we maintain year to year is our professional development account. Uh, that is level funded. Um, that account primarily is uh, designed to offer teachers curriculum hours to develop curriculum, to train them in one-to-one -one technologies, but also to help train technical staff on software tools that we use to maintain equipment in the district. So that's kind of split among those areas, uh, and that is, has been level funded. Um, and then if people need breakdowns of various areas or highlights I kind of have some charts if, if that helps uh, answer questions kind of as we move forward this kind of gives you a breakdown of the instructional tech uh, in the building so you can see most of the instructional tech is down in most of the accounts so these are more specific numbers of all all the accounts high school is decreased because the graphic slab um, lease ended and as you can see some of the other leases ended so the accounts are down Mr. Ghosh, yes. you have um, visibility into licensing. Do you have visibility into to what degree the licenses are being utilized? Yeah, to, to some extent. I mean, there's a, a wide variety of types of software we have, right? So we have uh, teachers utilizing free software tools. We have teachers utilizing um, premium tools where we're paying for them. And then we kind of have larger uh, implementations of big programs uh, like Star Math and some other district-wide licensing that we've we've put in. So most of the premium tools uh, like Lexia, like Star, all have insight and back-end tools that can give you detailed usage uh, 
reports that we kind of look at to see how they're being um, utilized by teachers and by students and how successful they're being. On uh, some of the free versions of tools, you don't necessarily get access to some of those um, insights because they want you to have the, the premium versions to get some of that, or they just don't exist. So things like Lexiat, which I know nothing about, I and mean, we, we have licensed teachers value this and they're using it we see that it's being used correct it's definitely being used we've looked at the licensing and the usage over years um, you know prior to dr kavanaugh um, other, you know previous superintendents had the same same question you know are these tools not only being utilized but are they being effective right. uh, so an, you know more than annually we're looking at those reports i am as a, a leader uh, principals have access to it and then teachers are seeing this on a more regular basis and so they're seeing their own class, their own individual kids. They're seeing the growth from kind of month to month. Uh, and we have access to that, and we're looking at those details. OK, thank you. Um, thank you back off that question. Sure. Um, one of the things I chatted down, do, when you do licensing, do you license a student or a machine? Um, most of the time, it depends on the company. But um, most companies have moved to subscription-based licensing which is typically now student-based, based on student enrollment. Okay. The, old, the old days, it right. was much like you bought Adobe, you bought Adobe for the building, it didn't matter how many kids you had in that building, you right. paid a certain amount. Now it's cloud, Adobe Cloud, it's based on the individual student, the individual student has a login, they can use that and they can keep track of how many people are, are using it and then charge us appropriately. So that for Lexi, for example, with a 200% increase, it's because each kid at Marathon is receiving a Lexia account? At Marathon, each kid is. So at, at Marathon, we have enough licenses for every kid. Uh, at the Elmwood School this year, we are trying to use it only for about 130 kids or 100 of the kids that were struggling and identified um, by the principal to get some extra support. We had larger numbers of Lexia in previous years in the budget cuts last year. We did try to reduce this area because we were struggling to find money for people. And so we did make some cuts, but we're able to bring some of it back. Um, and so this is just anticipating continuing with those licenses next year. Okay. Can I piggyback on your question? Please. Um, you said that these items, well, Lexia is being used and that it is effective. Is it more effective than using a book and a piece of paper and a pencil and a chalkboard or a smart board? Because it seems to me we're hemorrhaging a lot of money on these little electrical devices to which all the kids are extraordinarily addicted. Sure. And so why are we feeding their addiction with taxpayer money? Is it really making that huge a difference in how well they learn to read? Yeah, I wouldn't say it would never, I wouldn't say any technology is completely going to replace an educator. So I would never sit here and say that Lexi is going to be better than a literacy coach, per se, on a one-to-one -one basis. But in absence of a literacy coach or a staff member, and you have a large class of 24 students, and you're spending time and you're working in centers and you're working with some kids individually, those other kids can have an opportunity to get some differentiated instruction by using a tool like Lexia that's catered specifically for their need based on their reading level, that then the teacher can get those diagnostics from that device and then come and support that kid individually. So in that type of environment, I think it is effective, but I don't think the goal is to use the tool to teach the kid how to read. That is not, that is not the way we're, we're using this tool. It is a tool to support and to help differentiate when teachers are working one-on-one -on -one with other, with other so kids. So it's also a babysitting tool. Um, I, can, I can add to that a little yeah, bit if, if you want me to. Yeah, sure. Because um, I'll take a little bit of ownership, and sure. I didn't realize that we went up um, plus 238% or whatever you have on there for Lexia. But when I came into the district, I was very surprised to see the um, very small number of Lexia licenses that we had in our schools. And I appreciate um, what Ashok is saying that there were very severe, you know, it was a serious budget issue last year. And I appreciate that there was a reason why the cuts were made. Um, that is probably the number one program that I see schools and reading specialists and teachers getting excited about using because of the fact that it's research-based, it's endorsed by the National Reading Panel, it goes through every component of phonics, phonemic awareness. For the early literacy, for the ages of the students, especially at K-1-2, it's absolutely, to your point, Meg, it's not a substitute. It's not a teacher. 
but when we're looking at a classroom where we expect our teachers to be calling small groups and differentiating centers, it is something that's appealing, it's research-based, and I will tell you that even back when I was a principal here, I remember very clearly, so now we're going back eight, nine years ago, Mark Boisvert saying, Jen, you know, I can see these kids and they're on Lexia, and sometimes there's a kid who will sit there in 15 minutes, I can pull up their report and I can see, hey, so-and-so, you didn't do anything in 15 minutes, I'm on it, I'm on the reports, I'm in contact with parents in terms of student progress, but it really, um, it really addresses very critical early literacy skills, never to take the place of a teacher, but it is complementary in terms of the skills that we expect students to master um, at those levels. And I can't tell you like the, the hugs and kisses that were coming through the computer when we were emailing teachers saying, we've got some licenses back and Ashok was really gracious. And, finding a way to do that very, very with very quick turnaround this year. Um, but I do appreciate, to your point, like Lexi is a program that if you don't use it 15 minutes a day for a total of an hour a week, it's not going to have its maximum potential. So, and you know. if you have a learning difference, it doesn't. I mean, my son used it every day for a year or two, and it didn't help. And there's no, so, and to your point, yeah. every student is different. Yeah. But for the majority of students, it has been proven as a tool that that has been effective and, um, and... And what is the percentage of the day that they spend doing Lexia, do we know? Well, the recommendation is 15 minutes a day. Uh, so in school or out of school? It could be a combination. So in some cases we'll say, okay, you know, we can fit it in three to four days a week and then the expectation would be, can you do another 15 minutes at home? Um, but I think kind of to your question, Amanda, that's something that we really have to track because we don't want to be paying for licenses and then seeing them not go to use and to see them not being used to what the research says they should be. Yeah, because I, mean, I, I would imagine if you are studying how students are doing on it, you would be able to detect rather early on that they're having difficulties learning to read. Yeah, and but a teacher, that's not going to be the only way a teacher is going to determine that that will be one, it's one indicator for a teacher. Um, but the fact that it's adaptable um, kind of like one of the other programs that Ashok mentioned that we're um, testing out at the middle school this year, iReady Math. It is something that is very easily adaptable to students, and it, the program matches um, where the students are. And so students feel successful, it's engaging, and this is kind of the world that our students are living in. Yeah. They like electronics, so no, we I, don't I ever want to be in a classroom yeah. where we're substituting electronics. Yeah. For well, teacher, I, but I agree. They're very yeah. addicting things. Look at us all. Yeah, <laughs> what, what do you mean? <laughs> um, but uh, you know, 15 minutes a day is, is quite a small amount of time for such a lot of money being spent on this. So I'm just thinking out loud right. how much we're investing in that, and what about an extra 15 minutes of recess, and maybe that will inspire them to think better when they're actually using pencils and paper. So what's the actual dollar number? We have the percentage. Do we have? Um, I can look. I think it's um, up to 18,964 from 5,600, right? It's on page 35. Thank you. From 5,600. Um, so about from 6,000 to 19,000, looks like, for that specific item, the 238% increase. Correct me if I'm wrong, though, Ashok, a lot of the <clears throat> software for this fiscal year we were actually able to purchase through the building project, so it was mm -hmm. not something that was in our FY19 budget. So it shows so, as more of an increase than it actually is in terms of what's being used. Right. Is that so it's, uh, yeah, if we have roughly 500 licenses, let's say, at, at Marathon School, you know, at an average cost of $15. We're predicting 15 to $20 a license. Can I, I ask a question that mm -hmm. is related to this, but it, kind of a different angle on it? I had a question from a parent, and it, it's totally fine if you don't know the answer sure. to it, but maybe you, you could, we could email about it. Do we use currently Google tools for special needs on the Chromebooks uh, as an add-on at all? Or yeah, it depends on, it depends on the, the need, so it, it's, there's definitely different tools that are available, uh, and some some students have access to certain tools based on an IEP. So we are and able to use There are some free well. tools that they have available uh, on top of that. 
you know, so for example, some students have access to ReadWrite, uh, which is an add-on to, to Google that has a number of different functions that help help. That's students. actually the specific program I was thinking of. Yeah, so so we don't have you know district-wide licenses of that we just because we can't afford to do that, but um, we try to get it for the kids that, that need really it. need it. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. So um, I'm looking again at uh, page 35, which is the Muni report. So if I'm understanding this correctly, the overall in increase is 5.9%. So it brings the technology budget to about 2.1 million. Is that accurate? Correct, yep. Okay. Um, I think without the new position, it's roughly an increase of 0.6%. So I think a, a larger part of the increase, overall increase, is due to the new FTE. Um, sure. So actually, I'm, I'm excited that the work on the website, much needed work on website, is underway. Um, I'm wondering if you have considered, you know, either a part-time um, webmaster or even someone on contract that could come in and help for a little bit, rather than a FTE, which has a long-term effect. I wouldn't imagine that, you know, I would think that initially there's a lot of work to be done to get things going, but over a period in time, um, is the 80,000 salary, $80,000 salary plus increases justified. Given the student growth, I would think most of our money should go into getting our teachers, so that's, uh, that's a thought. Sure. And I have given it a lot of thought, and I think when you look at it just solely as a webmaster, um, you know, I would definitely consider a part-time position. Um, you know, based on, you're right, on a day-to-day -day basis, just updating average content, could a half-time person do that? Pro probably. Um, the other factors to consider, though, is yeah, at what level is the community and the school committee expecting things to be up-to-date and how perfect? would that need to be and to meet that expectation i would think a full-time better allows us to do that simply because things change so quickly so if it's a part-time person maybe they're working every other day or certain hours a day an event changes the responsibility of still now changing that event is going to fall back to one of us and not necessarily the webmaster because they're not working during that particular time so the 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 struggle possibly with the schedule um and their ability to not meet those expectations was one concern. The other concern is the technology department as a whole, you know, lost 2.6 FTE last year. So we lost two full-time um, tech integration people and we lost an administrative support person. So out of the salaries, my, my 0.6 support person um, was, was removed and we now have a shared person with the assistant superintendent. Um, beyond that, I look at the fact that we've taken on additional responsibilities. So, for example, we've centralized uh, registration district-wide. The technology department has taken ownership of most of that process. So, Megan, our support person, is primarily on a day-to-day -day basis dealing with daily online registrations that take up a lot of her time. So, when I look at this position and I talk to other principals and other people at the central office, I see it as a, also a position that's going to help us with a lot of other things. You know, hopefully, primarily account management, other central office tasks where we've kind of really consolidated over the last, you know, nine years. I mean, the central office footprint now compared to where it was nine years is quite small. Yet, the enrollment's gone up, our responsibilities have gone up, and so we've, we've, been able to continue to, to grow at the rate we're growing because we've put in place some efficiencies, right? So we're a little more efficient with the way we do registration, the way we do collect data. And so, yeah, we can get by with less, less people, but 2.6 positions less for us taking on more responsibility has been a challenge already this year. Sure. Uh, sure. And so when I, when I look at that, I, I do see it as a webmaster position with some other responsibilities. Um, you know, even Kim Polnick, HR, has talked about needing some extra help with recruitments and, and promoting uh, recruiting, and that person could possibly help in that area. Um, and so we had some conversations about how else we could utilize that position if it was a full FTE. Right, so, right. No, so, uh, so Ashok, I don't want to give the impression that there is no need. Uh, what I do know is that 
technology area requires those specialized skills, which are expensive to hire, right? So my suggestion is primarily coming from the fact that, is it that we could start with a part-time this year and perhaps the following year look to see where we are in increase? Um, and you know, we have to set the expectation straight for our community that with the growing increase, where is our priority? Is our priority in having a top-notch website first, or is it in having you know, the classroom needs of students sure. met? So that's where it's coming no, from. I, and I agree with that perfectly. Obviously, you know, classroom and educating kids is, is a priority. And so I, we're, we're open to considering a part-time position. I'm not opposed to that. Um, the other question is, again, I, I think back to some of the conversation around um, licenses. Mm -hmm. Clearly, we are getting a lot of licenses. And you know, um, I, I think I had shared this over the past year, that I'd heard um, you know, the ophthalmologist talking about, if I could, I would want to take technology out of kids' hands in um, elementary grades. They need more outside time, sunlight. It's absolutely needed. But obviously, these have become part of our lives. Um, so where is the balance, and how can we see that? You know, I, I understand the two million dollar budget and how much you support, right? These things working today. You know, um, this thing coming up. These are you know like buildings and grants. As long as it's perfect, no one even understands the work that goes behind it. So all of that is appreciated. Um, what I'm looking to understand is the impact of this to kids, especially in the elementary grades, K through five. What is the time we are spending on this? What is the actual benefit? Uh, you talked a little bit about differentiation, and I know Meg spoke about her son. My son did not like Lexia. Uh, although I know of other kids who love Lexia. He loves 10 marks, and I know all these options are available. So some insight into what, uh, you know, some of this work that goes on, I think that will be very helpful. Sure. Yeah, we would definitely you know, look at that. I guess I think some follow-up conversations about what that looks like. You know, is this something you're considering talking about full, full research, where we're going to research the impact of a uh, particular software or what's the overall impact of you know one-to-one -one computing on students I think is a bigger conversation so we can kind of clarify what the expectations are what the goals would be of that project and then we kind of look at how we go forward with it right. um, because it's something that we would be interested in helping achieve but at the same time looking at our current staffing that's going to be a hard thing to do as a department internally mm -hmm. um, without some outside help. And some schools have looked for outside help to do and run some of those studies. Uh, we participated with a company called Sun Associates uh, in year one after the one-to-one -one program. Uh, we, worked, we took a cohort of our, our staff, went to Sun Associates. Sun Associates does this type of research across, across the country. Uh, they taught us how to, how to do a program evaluation. We did a program evaluation of the one-to-one -one program at the high school. And that was, that was effective. It told us some things. But when you weigh the, the time it took versus the, the um, information we got, we weren't quite sure that the impact and the information we got was, was worth almost all the time that we put into it. And the researchers would come back and say, say some of the same things that they've seen with their work with other, with other districts. So I think it would be helpful to have a follow-up conversation to kind of target exactly what type of feedback we would want to, to try to look at what types of study or what type of sure. work we could do to get at that information. Sure. I know for one that I've asked this a couple of times, sure. so I'm happy to sit down with sure. you uh, with permission from Dr. Cavanaugh too. Um, and, and I guess uh, the bottom line is this, right? We need to know the return on our investment here, sure. right? So that accountability measure should be managed in, again, my opinion. Um, so I'm, no, and, I, I'm, and I agree with that. And I guess we would have to kind of define what that accountability looks like. Is the, is the school committee interested in looking at, you know, what is the impact of one-to-one -one devices or technology in achievement scores? Like, are we targeting? Are we trying to improve MCAS scores? Are we trying to improve you know, personal well-being? So there's a lot to kind of dig in and look at that before we can really get specific. But That's I would be happy to sit down with you and, and talk more about it. Sure. That's a conversation we can maybe sure. come back to it. it 
a, a, a different date just as a committee to come to a consensus on what it is. Sure. Thank can, you. Can I just ask mm -hmm. a quick, sure. um, quick organizational question, kind of along a little bit following on that. In terms of thinking about the budget and the headcount, um, so when we, we went learning tools like Lexia, my assumption was that it would come from the curriculum, the teachers or the curriculum or the principals would kind of typically find something and then ask you to maybe research it and purchase it, support it, install it, et cetera. Um, and when it comes to things like surveys, I mean, data analysis, I mean, there's, there's so much, but the whole IT arena has obviously blossomed and, you know, last 10 years so it is possible that your department is you know doing information business information analytics like what mrs henderson does or you know I, like it would be interesting for me to know what the services are that your department is providing sure. like and when we talk about adding a webmaster which i can definitely say through the website analysis the content management piece is a big piece that's going to make our website support our goal of being transparent and providing information and whatever and, and to do the content right we are going to need somebody at some level in the middle sure. but i'm wondering what are the services that we can ask the technology department for like if we want to start doing regular surveys on social emotional well-being if we haven't said we're going to but if we did would you help set that up what i mean is that an ask that comes to you or is it something that stays with the teacher or the principal if we want to look at MCAS data or financial data or just pulling data period from all the databases does that come to you guys or does that like what are the services that we are looking for you to provide like that's a, sure because I think the web the 1.0 for the webmaster I can I can definitely see Mina's point of a, a part-time webmaster sure. and I'm wondering I know there are a lot of demands the closer I am to your department I see the myriad of things that come your way so I think it would help to maybe define what you guys are trying to provide and and understand the difference between what you provide and maybe what comes from the teachers or the True. building. And there, and there is a process. I know you had kind of a question of early about, you know, what standards do we look at? And when we look at procuring a new software tool, you know, there is a process in place, you know, so there, you know, for example, in the Alexia world, I mean, that obviously did start from, from teachers and from previous curriculum directors kind of getting together and looking at a variety of tools, identifying criteria, and then making a selection originally for that product. So almost like an RFP process on a, on a bigger purchase like that. So uh, there are processes um, where teachers can try tools, can pilot tools. They get permission from CTLs or curriculum or department leaders. Uh, if that grows and meets kind of district needs, uh, we might kind of help purchase a small pilot or consider expanding that as needed if it's in alignment with what you know the standards are and what the teacher goals are uh, so there is that kind of um, vetting process in place uh, so depending on the size of the purchase or where it is you know it's there's like all the way up to a full rfp versus some teacher trying an individual free app um, you know by themselves Mr. Manning, do you have any questions for Mr. Ghosh? Mm -hmm. Great. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Unless anyone else has any other questions. You're welcome. Thank you all. Questions. Hopefully the snow is not uh, too much of a deterrent out there. I hope not. So we'll it, you can let us know if it is, though. So we, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mr. Person. <laughs> because you're going to be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. You know so the current <laughs> snow is. <laughs> Do you have the current? <laughs> did you look out there? I did. It's pro you probably got about a good inch. By the time you oh. guys wrap up, you'll be at about four inches. Talk, really? talk fast, Tim. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, buildings and grounds, um, as you guys know, I'm the director of buildings and grounds. Uh, my budget overview is... Um, uh, to help support our uh, current infrastructure of 120 plus acres 
and 620,000 roughly square feet of building that we maintain and clean on a daily basis. Um, so kind of the key factors that go in uh, for us, so for this budget this year is uh, the personnel summary. Um, my request for this year is to add two additional maintenance people um, <coughs> at the cost of um, $94,000. Um, these two positions will help us um, with the day-to-day -day maintenance of the buildings and grounds, um, the requests that come in, so on and so forth. So, um, <clears throat> um, the expense summary, which is um, the increase in expenses, one hundred and sixty-eight thousand um, dollars. Most of that is utilities and contracted services and extraordinary maintenance. Um, the utilities uh, really come from the Marathon School and uh, the additional square footage we picked up there. Um, these numbers that we put forth for this year are based on, um, we don't have any history to base it on. So we're going um, by just our couple months of experience and what we project out to be for the next year. Um, <clears throat> The uh, maintenance supply accounts have been increased for park, uh, things such as parking lot striping, um, and then again for Marathon School for a maintenance supply budget. Um, I, th I think the belief out there is because it's a brand new school that we don't have to put um, a lot of money into it. And we don't um, for fixes like uh, big HVAC fixes and stuff like that. We're still in the warranty, but what we do have to do is maintain the filters and do preventative maintenance on a lot of the building infrastructure so we can ensure that it runs properly you know going forward <clears throat> um, the system maintenance of equipment um, we just kind of increase that to meet fy18 actuals um, and the maintenance of equipment is the vehicles that we have uh, the tractors the trucks um, and as these things start to age, you know, tires, ball joints, you know, all that kinds of fun stuff that we do on our personal vehicles day to day, really kind of, you know, go into this stuff. So, um, so maintaining the equipment is going to kind of keep increasing until we hit into our capital plan and we start replacing some of this aging equipment. Um, <clears throat> extraordinary maintenance. So. Um, we're up twenty thousand uh, dollars, roughly, from last year, and this is to, um, you know, fix some of the again aging, aging pieces of buildings. Like at the Elmwood School, we have some shades that are torn, ripped, or don't function. Um, the gym partition walls; these, these seem to be kind of an ongoing thing for us. Um, as the buildings age, these need to be maintained. The tracks, so they, you know, so they open and close freely. So the uh, the wellness teachers have a the opportunity to separate classes um, as needed. <clears throat> the middle school, we uh, we want to fix the concrete in front as you walk into the middle school. I don't know if anybody has noticed it's kind of deteriorated over the years. There's big gaps in it. Could you know be a tripping hazard or you know, at the very least, an ankle, ankle sprain. Um, high school, um, we have the broken water feature out front here. I don't know that it's worked in a number of years. We'd like to <laughs> try to figure out something better to do with that. And um, and then in the district, we would like to uh, um, administer drinking water testing, which we've done in the past. We had a grant. Um, this was uh, prior to my my time here we had a grant to do so um, they went through and tested all the drinking water all the um, potable water in all the buildings in the district um, picking back up on that we'd like to um, see where we stand today with that testing uh, make some improvements and, um, and move forward with that and then <clears throat> the steps from field one to field three I don't know if anybody goes to the football games has walked down them but they're um, we're starting to replace rotting boards and stuff like that. We think it, it's really time for an upgrade for safety reasons. <clears throat> so the overall, so the overall increase to my budget because of the two new employees and some additional overtime would be two hundred and eighty-three thousand four hundred and thirty-five dollars. And with that, I'll take some questions. I'm sure you have some. I can go. Uh -huh. 
I think you first of all you do a fantastic job. <laughs> Thank you. Ta- taking care of stuff and like I was saying to Ashok earlier, as long as things are fine, people don't even notice the work mm-hmm. that goes on. But you do a fantastic job uh, from the time you have come. You know, you brought a, lo- a lot of energy into this area. Thank you. The question um, that I have, you know, clearly the things that you talked about with regard to maintenance, mm-hmm. absolutely see that. Yeah. You know, Elmwood. The middle school, they, uh, they require a facelift for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, right. And uh, of course, with the growing need. Um, now, last year, when uh, we planned uh, for Elm uh, for Marathon, mm-hmm. we did plan for some growth, and you know, uh, we had gotten some custodial support at that time. Yeah, we added a full time position for custodial. Right. And again, um, while I am not uh, questioning the, you know, the need to have all these services, knowing how much growth we are anticipating, yeah. forget 2020, just in 2019, sure. um, I would still think that our focus would go a lot into the classroom and the teachers and whatnot. So I'm wondering, uh, for the two personnel requests that you have, um, what would it mean if you didn't have it? So I think um, I think it would start to affect our preventative maintenance program that we've been trying to instill over the last year. So we currently we play a lot of catch up, you know. So if you'll see if you'll see the landscaping out front is looking a little tired, it's because we're focusing on the inside of the building and trying to fix um, you know the main infrastructure for the classrooms. So I think um, so I think. Without adding positions, that's a lot of what we'll, we'll just kind of keep running and maintaining what we have. Um, and the guys do a fantastic job. And, um, you know, all the credit that you give me, I have to give to them because they're doing the work out there. And, and I appreciate them for that. Um, so I think it's just additional support, you know, to, to help maintain. You know, I think ultimately what would make sense uh, for the district is to have a maintenance person in each location that takes care of the day-to-day uh, needs of the of the staff and the students um, and takes care of the building you know when you have people who jump from building to building um, I think you lose a little bit of the um, consistency in, in the maintenance programs um, you know this person's going to do filters, or they did half the filters, and this person's going down the next day. They don't know where they left off. So I think, um, and you pick up expertise. Is you know, everybody has a little different skill set. At least that's what we look for when we're hiring people. Somebody may be better at HVAC, and and so on and so forth. So um, I think that's you know, I think the request is you know, to try to get us to that level of maintenance that the buildings are starting to need, as you guys have seen over the years, and to prevent some of the newer buildings, this building, um, Hopkins and the Marathon School, from falling into some of the disarray that we had with Center School and um, with dealing with Elmwood now. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you being proactive. Yeah. I've certainly seen that. Sure. I'm just throwing it out there, and I said the same to uh, Mr. Ghosh. Mm-hmm. Is there a possibility for part-time? rather than a full-time employee. So something for you to mm-hmm. consider. Sure, sure. Um, I think part-time would be difficult. I think if, um, if given the choice, I would, um, I would eliminate one ask position and, and ask for a full-time position just for consistency. Sure. Um, but, I, you know, like, like Mr. Ghosh, I'm, I'm open-minded to anything, right? Right, and again, I'm <laughs> one, one voice here. Sure. Could you just, um, just for my own learning, just distinguish mm-hmm. between custodial and maintenance? Sure. Yes. So the custodians essentially take care of all the cleaning on the inside of the building. Okay. Um, and so we have a head custodian during the day who takes care of, you know, student activity, um, uh, lunch, lunch duties. Um, they do, you know, they're the head custodian, so they're doing all the supply orders and, you know, doing the... Uh, kind of the the jobs of what happens during the day when kids are in school Um, and then the night custodians are doing a bulk of the cleaning you know so they're doing the classroom sweeps and and washing and vacuuming and cleaning the restrooms and so on and so forth Uh, maintenance really focuses on the you know the bigger issues you know if the you know so a custodian may be able to and I'll use um, a restroom as an example plunge a toilet to get a clog free 
but if the issue persists, you need somebody with a little more skill to be able to, okay. you know, diagnose the problem, and take care of it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So, given that the the overtime requests, I would just are those primary, primarily custodial, or I'm just I'm looking if we add these sure. people, will it impact the ability to decrease the overtime at all? So I think I think minimally. So okay. our overtime for maintenance is typically um, during the winter, um, oh, uh, right. during snow events. So we have kind of all hands on deck. Um, they'll be here tonight at some point, and they'll be. You know, we work closely with the DPW. To, um, to make sure that the schools are ready to be open in the morning. So that's a lot where our maintenance overtime goes. A little bit can go to sports um, at times. If there's events happening, you know, uh, field three, we have a maintenance employee work that, you know, those, those games. Um, custodial overtime, we do, uh, I would say a, a bulk of the custodial time, we charge back through our, our use, our building use. Um, but we, we do hit, um, you know, events from the school itself, um, basketball games, plays, you know, so on and so forth. Micro event is a big event that we hold here that um, we, don't, we don't charge back for that. Um, school committee meetings. School committee <laughs> meetings. Uh, <laughs> sure. No, that makes sense. Yeah. And, and I would echo what Mina said. Your department it really does keep things in a very nice, in you. Well, thank you. Yeah, they, they work hard. Much appreciated. We appreciate them, yeah. Can I ask a quick question about sure. utilities? The utilities yeah. increase. Are, are yeah. we looking more gas or electric? Where are we? So um, Susan can probably help me with this, but I think a little bit of both, you know, so the maybe. Yeah, so there's, there's two factors in here, um, and this is a little bit to kind of what uh, Karen had to make up for. So we had transferred prepaid tuition. Yeah. Uh, the school committee did a budget transfer from that to cover the salaries. We also did the same with a one-time rebate yes. for utilities that was deposited into the marathon account. So this is to bring that back up. So while that budget transfer went to salaries, so when you look at 19 to 20, your salaries is a little bit less of a change because of that expense transfer. But the, the bottom line is we're not increasing the electricity uh, in terms of this budget. We're pretty comfortable with that. Okay. And both the electric and the gas came from the engineering estimates when they put together the budget for the building project. Tim and I are both a little bit uncomfortable with the gas estimate. So this increase really is the gas estimate. And what we did is we aligned it to a building of a, of the similar square footage, which really is the Hopkins. Um, okay. So we brought the gas up mm -hmm. to be in line with Hopkins. We're a little more comfortable with the electric estimate, but the difficulty is we still have no experience right. um, in, in what the reality of it is. So the increase in the gas is actually um, 60, around 60,000, mm -hmm. the remaining increase. That 127 is the use of that rebate. Okay. So it's two factors that make it look really high, and it really is only the adjustment to the gas. Thank you. It's, it's probably a very simplistic and silly question, but mm -hmm. at home, I would yep. just sort of turn the thermostat down if my budget was a little. <laughs> I, mean, sure. I know it's kind of crazy, but I do see a lot of students who go straight through the winter in short mm -hmm. sleeves. You know, no big deal, and the buildings are really yep. warm. And I always yep. just kind of wonder if we t set the thermostat five degrees cooler. Like, <laughs> I mean, so we we do make attempts. We we have building management systems in each one of the buildings, okay. varying in um, degrees of complexity. Obviously, at the Marathon School, it's a brand new pro right. program, so. We do night setbacks um, and so on and so forth to bring the, the heat down to um, like you would do at home, yeah. you know. So, you know, we're setting the thermostat at 60 when we go to bed at night, right? So um, that's kind of what we do at all the schools. Uh, during the day, we have to maintain a temperature between 68 and 72 degrees. Um, so the average, what's great about the building management systems is I can really kind of follow them. The average at the uh, marathon school is about 69 degrees. Now, some classrooms will be 72 degrees and some classrooms will be 68 degrees. But, um, 
you know, they're never really perfect when you, even in a brand new building, these systems, the way they work, they're never really perfect to where the whole building's gonna maintain the same temperature. But we do, um, and we do the same thing with the lighting programs down there. We, um, we have that on, on setbacks and like the outside lighting, it, Jen knows she's in those I'm shaking meetings. my head because we're in there at meetings at night and everybody's got the coats on. It's, it's nighttime, you know, sure. setting right now. Yeah, we're all sure. freezing, yeah. But even like the street lights outside, um, they're set. We can change the percentage mm. of, the, of how they're lit uh, during the year. So in the summertime, we may bring that percentage down to 50% where you don't need as much light in the in, in the dead of winter we might be closer to 80 percent never a hundred because they're they're so efficient but yeah. um, but we have those capabilities in in some of our some of our buildings yeah that's great thank you thank you very much right mr manning do you want do you want to add anything or any questions just for clarification sure. So there's a, there's a potential, so we budgeted this year's budget based on the engineer's estimates, both for electric and gas. The gas is extremely low, and even when they gave that me that estimate, I was like, hmm. Um, that's the number that we're still uncomfortable with, so we did increase that beyond what the engineer's estimate is. Now, as the year comes on, now we're, we haven't hit winter yet. You know, maybe their estimate will prove true, and we can bring that number back down, but without having experience, I'm uncomfortable with doing that. Yeah, but actually, as you approach the final numbers, maybe January or February, you'll have idea. Yeah. That's what we need, is we need a couple of months of winter to get an idea. Nobody right needs now. winter. <laughs> you don't need a couple of months. Started today. <laughs> but, but that's, yeah. both Tim and I are uncomfortable with that estimate. Yeah. So, yes. Next question. So I think there's shift, there's shifted costs because of it. You know, so we're um, we're going to take, the, you know, we're going to take the kind of the money and the hours that we would have spent down on those turf fields, and we'll reinvest it into some of the other areas that may have been a little more neglected um, through the years. Uh, there is some maintenance that is required on the turf fields that we'll have to attend. Um, you know, making sure the trash and leaves are, you know, so you maintain it as a field in the sense of cleaning it up, you just don't have to spread grass seed and, and mow it. Um, but there is, a, there is a little bit of maintenance that's required with the field that we'll continue on with, yeah. And, and Tim, what was the recommended nighttime temperature you said? 60 degrees? Um, yeah, so, <laughs> well, how's it feeling here? It's about 65? It feels like it's a little yeah, yeah, it's, it's dropping. dropping. It is dropping. I, was gonna, <laughs> I have Amanda on my side, so you guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, a marathon has such open spaces. No. Right, yeah. huge. Uh, yeah. The good part about Marathon, too, is it's really a, it's a very efficient building, you know. So when you're not occupying a classroom, it has a sensor in there saying that you're not occupying it, both lighting and uh, air conditioning-wise, you know. Um, now, in some of the smaller rooms, that can become an issue because it'll, it'll drop it too cool or make it too warm. So if somebody's running in and out, so we're, we're still playing with that stuff. Okay. But it really is, uh, it's, it's really, they did a nice job designing the building management system and the building. Yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very Good much. Luck tonight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fingers crossed for a quiet <laughs> night. So that concludes our budget presentations for tonight. And just to, to recap for people at home and also for people, a refresher for people here, the number that we started with, it's, it's a very fluid process. It, every meeting from now until we pass a budget, we will continue to go at this budget and we'll come back I'm pointing for you. We'll come back with new facts and figures, and hopefully, we'll come to a a much um, happier number than what we started with. So, to be continued. Can I ask a question? I just noticed this. Otherwise, yes. I would have asked you before. We didn't hear from athletics tonight. Are there athletics enough? Are there other departments specific? 
they were. I know they weren't on the agenda. Yeah. The agenda. I know they're not. We didn't hear from them. Period. <laughs> but is that is there a reason why they were not tonight? I think that what we do is just divvy them up. Oh, okay. So okay, okay. you know, five budget presence tokens are roughly at a time. You know, and I think that. I appreciate so, that. Colleen, Janino, and Craig Hay were obviously quick ones because their budgets are small. So, okay. you know, we try to balance Okay. Them. All right. That's what I was. It did originally say on the original document, though, that we. It, it was it shifted. It, you okay. didn't imagine that. I know, All right. where you're I know where you're going with that. Thank you. So I am just going to address for people at home and for all of us here also that we have, we're a little bit out of order because we don't have the recognitions people are going to come to our next uh, first December meeting. Uh, we don't have any members of the public, so we're not going to do public comment. And our student council, because of the weather, were advised by Mr. Bishop to stay home for tonight, and they can double report the next time they come. So that will bring us up uh, into, and, and also we did appreciate a savings of time because Dr. Zaleski did the visually impaired teacher, so that we'll save that later on. Because of the weather and the time, it, it is possible that we may decide later in the meeting to forego some of the policy and push that off to another meeting. We can decide that as we move along but that will bring us then into our um, quarterly financial report thank you um, so what you have is similar in um, format if you will to the last time that I reported the cover sheet shows basically in a summary that right now we are under budget for payroll but we are over budget in expenses so right now we are running at a negative variance at 112,000. Um, you can see down below the payroll accounts in terms of how we've not only covered uh, what needed to happen for the FTEs that were hired during the year, um, but we've also had personnel attrition, which means basically hiring savings. Um, so as we've hired or people have left the district we've been able to hire at less than what was in the budget um, so that was a savings you can see the columns um, as teachers filed and and made their lane changes that came in higher than budget um, we had utilize utilization of our salary reserve the positions that were added after the budget the positions that were not either not filled or utilized as part of that um, shift uh, our other payroll variances basically at this point in time are long-term sub estimates and that will continue to be fluid um, moving forward and then that last piece that you've heard spoken about both from dr. Zaleski and and mr. person in terms of transfers from expense accounts into the payroll accounts um, this number will continue to change as the year goes on um, so just this is a snapshot in time of where we are right now uh, so that's your payroll in the expense side right now you can see um, really kind of the two big movers are still our out of district um, tuitions and while the number right now still looks high um, I will say that Dr. Zaleski is actively working with a couple of families on some changes um, some positively but she also did mention that we also had another move in that was a you know stay put out of district um, placement so this number will again also continue to change so my thought right now because we are running a negative variance is that I would not at this point in time advise any changes and if this were to continue then my advice to the school committee would be to look to circuit breaker so one of the reasons that we've put our circuit breaker um, more in alignment with what our receivable is or for instances such as this um, but again this number will continue to change it's still early in the year and I know Dr. Zaleski has um, some things that she knows will change so so that's a summary in terms of where we are right now. Are there any questions? So I, I in looking at the, I, I really, I like how you did a little summary because that's much easier for me to understand. The, the negative variance is that, and I know it does change month to month, and I remember last year we got to, I think it was January, February, we had a needed to freeze the budget. Mm -hmm. Are we headed that in that direction or do we have enough flexibility if, if we were to hold where we are right now I would say that we'll be okay okay um, 
last year with me being unfamiliar with how principals actually budget and actually spend. Um, I'm a little bit more comfortable with our ability and also keeping an eye to utilization of an account such as Circuit Breaker. Great. Thank you. I don't know if anybody else had. No, that was a good question. Okay. And, and you'll see that this summary does include um, the increase of the TVI. This would have been a quick introduction, so since everything was out of order, this already does include the increase of the TVI that you voted tonight that was presented by Dr. Zaleski. Oh, great. Thank you. So that's already in here as well. Great. Okay. Thank you. Oh, did you have something? Yeah, I had one question which I can't seem to find that particular line item, but there's another one that's interesting. What's the school choice, dollar eighty six? So at some point in time this is just an inactive revolving account that's just sitting there. It's eighty six dollars. Uh, I don't know where that account came from, um, but it's just sitting there. I haven't had school choice in Hopkinton in my entire recollection of Yeah, so chances are it's a misnamed account that has missed, misnamed money in it, mm -hmm. and so it's just sitting there right now. Sure. Yeah, if anyone else has any questions, I'll try and find the one that, that one line item. Are you going to talk about revolving accounts or later, or are we there now? Ask We're away. Now. This okay. is it. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just remind me, and I know you've told me this, and I didn't quite sink in, the column that says offset for the budget. On the, on the revolving accounts um, sort of summary page here. And it has the account name, carryover, receipts, et cetera. The last column is offset for the budget. I know there's a connection between what Mr. Person just talked about with buildings and grounds and some of the revolving account money goes there. Could you explain where the, what column that comes from and how to read that? Cause I so what the MUNIS report that you see is the operating budget, which is general fund money. Yep. Okay. In addition to the general fund money are these revolving accounts. Yep. So the first one is the athletic revolving. So the athletic revolving collects student sport fees and gate receipts for basketball games, football games. Um, so it, it's collecting those. That account is used to pay some of your athletic coaches. Yeah. So whereas the budget in gross numbers is probably 500,000, what you see in the Munis report in terms of the general fund is 250 because the other 250 is coming out of the sports fees Thank you. revolving account. And that's the offset column. And that's I'm what you summary of the page. Here. Yes. Okay. So that's what your offset is. Thank you. It would be really wonderful to have like a one or two page description of each of the revolving accounts, like not to, you know, for a rainy day, mm -hmm. like where does the money come from and where are we allowed to use it? Because I think there are restrictions on some of them and I don't really, I know, I can infer a lot of it, but I don't think I'm always right, like, in right. my understanding of things. So. Right, yep. If it ever, if you ever have a spare moment, Absolutely. it would be really nice to have that. Yeah, I, I thought, um, you know, Mr. Dumas, right? Um, oh, yes. He had a spreadsheet which explained each of the abbreviations, if you will, he had shared at some point with me. Not that it gave a great deal of detail, but at least it explained that. Um, I wonder if that could be a starting point and if, again, have the spare moment to expand on that at all. On the, the revolving accounts? Um, all, of, all of those abbreviations, actually, all the accounts. Um, all the MUNIS accounts. That's right. Yeah, I'm not able to find that particular item. Maybe, maybe I'm going to. There was more a clarification um, that I had. I recall seeing it, but I can't seem to find it right now. So that's fine. Okay. So with that, there are no more questions. No. Okay. To your report. So we'll go to my report. Uh, so I am actually reporting on some of the things that appeared in my goals back in the summer. 
Um, as Ashok told you during his presentation, uh, he updated us on our student population numbers. We are currently at 3,746. When we met in August, we were at 3,721. So since the start of school, we've brought 25 new students into the district. And a major focus for me was how to build a budget around the population growth. Um, so I met with the administrators today, just the building principals and uh, Jen and Susan and we talked about some of the things that they currently have in their budgets and how do we ensure that we are putting teachers in front of students given the increase in population because I think that that has to be probably our primary goal. Um, you know, obviously in our school improvement plans we have important things like social emotional learning and we are bringing in the Bright program and we are at this point sort of unwilling to abandon that work because we think that it's really important. And as Dr. Zaleski said tonight, it keeps kids in district and you know, we are finding that kids come to us with social, emotional and behavioral needs that we really need to be able to you know, sort of address in district. Uh, we will be meeting again on November 28th and we'll continue to whittle away at those budgets to ensure that we do something that is fiscally responsible. Um, and the final part of the budget work is that Susan and I met with Mr. Kamalo today and we had some conversation today about thinking about doing that um, student growth in population, just population growth in Hopkinton, kind of a, a study so that maybe we could go in with the town and they could look at its impact on other municipal entities, so things like fire, police, and all of that, and we would look at its impact on the school, uh, schools and our building and our programming. So hopefully we'll be able to put something like that together. We looked at the timeline um, that Westboro used in 2015. They put out an RFP in January and they had a report done by June. So that's promising, I think. That's great. Yeah, if we can make that happen, it will be wonderful. So we're not sure we can make it happen, but we're looking, hopefully, that we can make that happen. Um, the next thing is that I had a, a NISIP meeting yesterday, and so the data portion of the um, data entry findings was shared with that group, and it's also been shared with the entire administrative team. So. That will, you know, eventually be sort of addressed. We'll take a look at all of that data and try to figure out what it's telling us. Um, and then it will be sort of synthesized so that it's prepared to go to the focus groups when we start working on that in Janu January to develop our strategy. Um, at the CAPE conference, we had an opportunity to meet with DESI and a couple of panelists from different districts that, is that have just gone through the um, strategy development. They were uh, Sagis, Concord Carlisle, and... Um, Weston, Wellesley? Weston, I think. Weston, you think? Um, and uh, they sort of indicated that we were on a pretty good timeline. They had talked about um, really, you know, rolling up their sleeves, I think, in probably January. And, you know, after this sort of background legwork was done. And NISIP follows that same, you know, protocol that DESI puts out there. So I think in terms of timeline, we're actually in a good place with that. And then the Let's see, final thing maybe? Uh, listening tour, I'll be meeting with CPAC very soon. I will be meeting with uh, the five of you very shortly. Um, Admin Council met on Tuesday and we continued some of our, our book study work around um, culture and diversity. And I've just reached out to some of the high school kids and hopefully uh, they will be helping me put together something on the 5th of December. So information about that should go out tomorrow from our office. And I think that's all I have. What is that work related to, working with the high school students? Uh, the diversity work, okay. yeah. So I'm hoping that they are actually putting it together. A theme that I had suggested to them was, uh, if you believe, and then all of the statements after that would sort of be our agenda for that meeting on the 5th. And we will invite everybody who is uh, interested in hearing from the kids and what's happening in school. That's great. great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, then I will go into the school committee uh, chair report, and I just a, a couple of quick things before I do the um, account the warrants. The budget advisory group did meet uh, for the first official meeting with uh, Mr. Manning and Mrs. Wright, Mr. Camolo, and Dr. Cavanaugh and I, and it was really it was a preliminary discussion that that from a town perspective our numbers did seem a little high. Um, to them, which we expected, and again, for everybody watching at home as well, it uh, those are very preliminary numbers, and we've already started working down. Um, but that, see, it, one of the things we had discussed was the 
population and, and growth study, and I am happy to hear that has moved forward with the town. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other thing that they had, uh, Mr. Kamalo had talked about was the money from Legacy Farms that will be coming. They, they did hear back from the developer, and that money is going to, to come to the town in not the too distant future. So those were both good things. Uh, also, Mina and I uh, had the opportunity to do agenda planning with Dr. Cavanaugh and with Georgia, and that seems like a nice little model to work forward, and we will meet again, the four of us, before we have our next meeting to plan out and uh, hopefully uh, move forward in a good way. Nancy, if I may ask a question sure, on the course. budget advisory group. Was there any sharing of information on uh, you know, uh, what is the money coming in as part of new growth? I, they did not share specific numbers. On no, we don't know those numbers. It, no. it, it was a preliminary meeting without a whole lot of numbers from really either side. It's just because we had we haven't had the opportunity for our individual budget thing, more of a um, opportunity to plan out some of the collaboration for here going forward. Sure. And you talked about the five hundred thousand um, dollar. Based on my understanding, I know there was some back and forth going on, but last I checked, all that money was to come in directly to the schools, right? So it, it actually has to go through the town first. Okay. It, it, the way it's written in the host community agreement is that it is to go into a, a gift a, a gift account. I don't want to mess the wording up on it, but it's a, a gift account for the use of the school, but it goes payable to the town of Hopkinton. Sure. So it, they are having all the people on the town side take a look at it before to make sure everything comes in and is allocated appropriately and in the way it was intended. Right. But it doesn't require any further approvals or what have you, right? So that's, we're waiting to hear on that. There has been um, different cases in different towns of how gifts from developers are, have been allowed to use in terms of uh, case law so that we want to make sure that we've we're following precedents set by other districts. Sure. And I'm wondering, uh, Ms. Rathamich, as you presented the quarterly report, um, did that account for the $500,000 we're expecting to come from Legacy? Uh, no, I don't. It's I don't, not in there. I don't put in revenue. Okay. Right. So this is, this is the budget that has been voted at town meeting, right. and then your um, what has been appropriated by the school committee from those revolving accounts. I see. I see. Yeah, that that just makes us feel comfortable to me, especially looking at what you have presented for the quarterly report and knowing that this is an additional source of funding we're waiting for. So great, thank you. Correct, and that ultimately that is something that the five school committee members would have authorization to figure out how the growth has impacted us and how we would want to use it and perhaps plan for some some year and some in the next year and so on. So. Thank you. That was that. And then the other thing is uh, we, I, we had talked about doing office hours on Sunday at uh, 1 I I am happy to do that. If somebody else is available to do it with me, I would love that. Um, or, or if two people wanted to do it separate from me, that's I, fine. I can join you. Excellent. Um, and we had talked about location, um, but didn't uh, one location we had discussed was doing it here before Godspell. I also had been open to other possibilities if people wanted to make it in a different place. What would the temperature be? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, the temperature would be on for Godspell because it, it, if we in this room, it would be more than six. I, we would be out there. I would think so. People would see us a little bit like me. I would envision kind of out on those little tables right out there, so people could walk just slightly away from the where they're coming in for the production. So we're saying warmer you would come. I'll, I'll wear my coat. I'll be fine, no matter the okay. temperature. I'm just glad it's it's here and not in. Hey, on the common. <laughs> oh, so Sunday, November 18th at 1.30 p.m.? Yes. That Thank work? you. Yes. And it will be just for one hour, or how? We could stay through intermission. We could stay for however long. I want to watch God's spell. Yes, definitely. We could, well, we could, well, another thing we could do is we could watch it, and we could come out for the intermission, and, or at the end as well, for people to catch. I think that sounds great. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right. So we, um, if we could maybe send a listserv out, that would be great. Um, okay. I, I will send that out to Georgia. And then that. Oh, and then on the 29th, we will have the um, MASC Professional Development, which is of no cost to us, um, and we will do that so that we can also have an opportunity to eat over in the uh, conference room over in Central Edmond. So this is what day again? This is Thursday, November 29th. Thank you. So the and the MASC presenter will come at seven. For all those who are interested in dining, we will we can dine at 6:30 ahead of time. So that was it for my small announcements. And then I also wanted to say I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrants 19-041, 19 19-042, 19-043, 19-044, 19-045, and 19-046. All warrants have been included in your packet. And I have approved for payment the payroll warrants S19010 and S1910A, which actually I think is the one that you approved. Yes. Uh, and then it, are, are there liaison reports that anybody has um, from the last meeting? I have a really quick one. Um, I went to the HOP Coalition meeting um, yesterday, and um, just the key points, I believe the first week of January, like the 9th or the, t or I think the 9th, the first. This could be the ninth. Ninth or the sixteenth, but I think the ninth was where we're leading. They're going to screen um, a movie called If They Had Known, which I had an opportunity to screen uh, for De for Denise uh, with my teenage son, and um, was it? I thought it was excellent. It was um, a little bit. It was very real and a little bit raw, and it was really focused on the dangers of mixing um, prescription medication and um, alcohol or drugs, and. Um, it wasn't preachy. It was, I thought, very effective for ninth grade and up. Um, and they're going to be screening it for high school students. They're trying to pick a, a date close to school break for college students. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of universities that screen this film as well. So um, it is, there can be unintended consequences for students who are taking prescription medication um, and then they choose to drink and they just don't know it's deadly and then there are also many consequences of taking medications that aren't prescribed to you so I highly recommend the screening um, keep an eye out for the 9th of January great. that's great yep. thank you others I'm none. all right hearing none then we will move on to the uh, revision of the 2018 to 2019 school calendar all right so you remember that Lauren DeBeau came to see us um, about moving kindergarten screening. And the only reason that we need your vote on this is that you have to vote to approve the calendar. And so since we are moving those dates to March 11th, 26th, and April 5th, um, I am looking for your approval. Yeah. Is there so a motion? Moved. So a motion by Meg. Is there a second? Second, second by Mina. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. And it is approved. That moves us into the co-op gymnastics team. Super. All right. Um, so you saw in your packet that D. King, who couldn't be here tonight, um, is looking to run a co-op gymnastics team with the town of Westboro. Uh, I think we only have uh, three kids who have signed up for it right now. It would begin immediately because winter sports will start now at the end of November. Um, the town of Westboro is paying for the coaches and the coach actually owns the gym so there is no gym fee so essentially this would allow three of our students to take part in a gymnastics team um, Westboro is looking to us because they don't actually have enough students over there to field a team so if we join in with them they'll have enough students to field a team and Joe Ana de Carlo who is the athletic director over there has reached out to Dee and all the arrangements have been made accordingly so what we are looking for you to do is to um, approve the high school co-op gymnastics team with Westboro High School. So I just have a couple of comments. First of all, I think Dee does such a fantastic job of um, you know, finding all these programs and implementing them. Um, it's amazing, her ambition and her vision for the kids, the athletic department, hats off to her. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same vein, I think why don't I see more programs related to, say, science or math? 
Um, and, you know, I know there are things going on, but I would really like to see a little bit more of that in other areas as well. And maybe, you know, these are opportunities where, you know, this thing that she has presented, it's at no cost to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so how can we find those programs in other areas as well? I would really like to see that too. And, you know, D is certainly a trailblazer here. And if we can see more of that in other areas, I'd be excited to support uh, those programs as well. But wholeheartedly support this. Excellent. Thank you. So I apologize because this is a question that came to me um, this afternoon, and you may not know the answer to this, and that's fine. We can come back to it. It's not a hold up. But the, in looking at the registration for athletics, it appears that is Hopkinton taking a registration, f uh, an athletic fee from these kids as well? Because the kids also have to pay for Ooh. Westboro. Um, I do not know uh, the answer just, to it, that. Just that was the. And it was not, not in just in the information that we had. It, it was not, and I, I only noticed it when I was registering my own child on the mm -hmm. high school athletics. I did see the gymnastics is able to accept registrations, and it appears mm -hmm. that Hopkinton is looking for a registration fee, but it also had a note that they would owe an athletic fee to Westboro, and I didn't know if th there's probably a way yeah. in the, the system to opt out of the Hopkinton one, but that would be my... Yeah. So maybe for the athletes, so whatever the Westboro fee is, yeah. if they pay us, we'll pay them. Yeah. I'll just say I had a few um, questions, which Ms. King answered very nicely. Um, I wasn't very familiar. I'm just repeating this sort of for the audience. I wasn't familiar familiar really with the co-op um, type of program. I know we do it with hockey, and I had concerns given that a lot of this is based on the assumption that it is this coach who um, is donating her space and you know if this coach moves or decides not to do this any longer we've then created a team and we'll want to continue to support that but then we're taking on cost and so forth um, I you know I also wasn't really sure um, where the oversight for a co-op program comes in do we have oversight of the coach um, would um, our athletic director have some review process or have any connections Etc. I had kind of a long list of questions. She was very, very gracious in responding to all of them. I feel um, pretty confident with this particular team, having had these exchanges with her, that um, it is a very well vetted coach. And I think, um, I want to say it was something like 15 years she's run the gym in Westboro. Mm -hmm. Um, they have all the appropriate insurances, et cetera, that we would be concerned about. So I'm sure this is all obvious to you, but I was kind of concerned, you know, on our behalf that we were outsourcing to a location that was under someone else's um, oversight. So I felt much better about that. Um, and it seems most likely that this will be a, a zero cost endeavor for us. Um, I think they'll take up to 24 students. They want to keep it fairly low as a coach and an assistant coach. I was concerned about spotting a gymnast on the uneven bars. You've got one coach here and someone's on a balance beam. and. Um, but it seems to be really well thought out. I really appreciated Ms. King taking the time to provide the information. So, Yeah, I thought she did a really nice job. She did, yeah. on short turnaround, while also balancing yes. playoff schedules. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right, then if there are no other questions. Jen was saying something. Well, I was going to oh, just, my, I mean, your your point about the user fee, is, a, is that would be my one, yeah. I mean, I love everything about this except that, because the kids shouldn't have to pay double. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, I would love to vote on this tonight and say yes, but I really would like to know if we're asking these kids to pay double. So, if it would be permissible in the motion to exclude the, to add wording sure. to that prevent students these, that students only pay one only user fee. Yes, absolutely. They, either, they either pay ours or theirs, the, yeah. however that works out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that in the memo, though, It right? does not say in the memo, but if you go onto the high school athletics registration, okay. it the first page directs you to pay the $200 athletic fee to Hopkinton, for, that's for all of the Hopkinton high school teams and middle school teams for that matter. And then it says under that that they would also need to pay Westboro Athletics their athletic user fee, which right. I don't I'm And good sure for looking, because when I read the, the memo, it didn't, it, to me, it didn't register as a double. It said you it, would it pay didn't. for Westboro. And, so. and it just, it, it only happened to come up as I was okay. in my own personal business. So in terms of crafting a 
the wording on that without making it too awkward. Um, in, unless you had, do you have specific wording you'd like to add, or do you want me to take a second? Uh, no, but I can think so, about it. <laughs> or, really so the motion could be to approve the high school co-op gymnastics team and have Hopkinton athletes pay one athletic fee or something of that. How about with the stipulation with the stipulations that pay only Thank one you. user fee? Yes. 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 Yeah. Good. Exactly what you said. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down, right? Okay, so I would seek a motion then to approve the high school co-op gymnastics team with the stipulation that Hopkinton athletes pay only one athletic user fee. So moved. Second. So motion by Meg, second by Mina. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that is so moved. And we already did the teacher of the visually impaired need, and that brings us down to the general food service worker. Thank you. Um, so as you know, we are in the you know early stages of a new food service director um, moving away from outsourcing. Um, one of the areas that we're looking at, so the good news is our meal counts are going up. Um, we're getting good feedback in terms of the quality of the food. So these are all good, positive things. And one of our areas that is a very busy place is the middle school. Um, the middle school kitchen itself is probably the most challenging in terms of both the setup and the size and everything and the number of students that we're serving. Um, so in an effort to really move these kids through the line faster, what we're looking for is another worker that would be part-time that really would be on the line um, helping to serve and move the kids through. The middle school also has probably the shortest amount of time between lunches. Um, so once you put the kids through, you need to get your next, you know, trays up and, and refill. So it's a very busy kitchen. Um, and just as a reminder, this is not something that um, has any impact to the school operating budget. The food service is a self-supporting um, revolving account. So this position, even though it's in an additional position, would be absorbed within that food service account. So, I had a couple comments. I, did, I didn't want to cut anyone off. But uh, one is, this was a, a really good move that you had brought the suggestion forward. I have heard only good things about the changes that have been made this year. Good. The middle school, I have heard the feedback that more kids are buying, the lines are quite long, and in terms of looking at social and emotional stuff, that break for kids is important to have during lunch. Absolutely. And when they're waiting in line for the bulk of their lunch period and I eat, have to throw away part of their lunch because they didn't have enough time to eat it, that's not a good break. So I, I, I would support this, but mm -hmm. I would want to hear from if anybody else had any. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. I think I read um, comments on social media where parents were talking about this. So this is a very good move. Thank you for listening and putting this in place. Mm -hmm. All right, then if there are no more questions or comments, I would seek a motion to approve the general food service worker for the middle school. So moved. Second. So motion by Meg, second by Mina. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. It's unanimous and it so carries. So at this point, um, we it is 9.30. We have uh, one, two policies and we have the, we, we definitely have to do that overnight approval, I would say, yes. Yes. And then we can, do people have the appetite to push through or do you want to push the policies off to the next? I think either way is. Uh, I think we can go through this. Okay. It shouldn't take so long, I would think. No, we're going to actually end up still being ahead of schedule, right. would be my guess. Right. Right. Let's keep at it. Okay, let's keep at it then. So let, we can go ahead and go in order then. So the first policy we have is uh, school committee policy JJE, student fundraising activities, and that is a second reading. Um, I did not receive any feedback. I don't know if you received any. We did not. Um, and I think that the major change that was made here, which was really not a major change, um, is that uh, originally this policy said that uh, proposals would be submitted to the building principal and to the superintendent. And I think that we felt like submitting it on both levels would be overkill. So we just reduced it to the building principal in those three paragraphs, um, paragraphs three, four, and six. 
Dr. Kavna, I just have one question. I got a comment from a parent talking about, um, you know, going to watch their child play and having to pay $10 ticket fees every time. Um, is there any guideline on, you know, how we charge? Uh, Maybe we better ask Mrs. Rotherman. <laughs> 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 Do you want to talk about gate receipts? So typically, I mean, the gate receipts are part of your athletic revolving. Um, so typically the gate receipts are, you know, spread equally. So what we're charging for the TVL league, the Tri-Valley league. So if somebody, another school is charging X for basketball, we try, we try to line up with, with that and not be over-absorbent. Yeah. Typically it's um, evening Evening gate at gate receipts, right? and, like afternoon games don't tend to have a f ticket right. or fee. Right, right. yeah, it'd be evening. Right, uh, like I said, you know, this is a comment from a parent, and you know, some some may qualify for perhaps um, some break there with regard to uh, the tickets and whatnot. Does that happen? That I'm not sure of, and it I do sympathize i'm a parent of a basketball player as well so i know exactly what this is like um it it uh you know there are certain things that can be done what i've seen done in other districts as a, as a for instance instead of gate receipts one night bring an item for the food pantry as a okay. as a for instance okay. um you know so there can be some things that we can look at in terms of trying to be creative um, the unfortunate thing about it is we rely on those gate receipts. Those become directly part of your budget right. um, as in the revolving um, account. Absolutely, I, I hear it, though. Right. It is and interesting, I get it. though, because it isn't actually very consistent. I mean, like, we'd be thrilled if you came to watch a soccer game. Nobody really comes to those games. And we don't tend to charge. We, we had a few night games. We don't tend to charge. I'm not sure why. Um, or we didn't this year with, I, don't, I really don't know the rationale. I also went to a volleyball game, a JV game, close to five, but it was the JV game and I had to pay for that. So I, it's a little bit uneven. Um, concerts tend to be free, except t they tend to do pops. maybe the pops and sometimes they do one um, concert that is a fundraiser they'll identify in advance. And plays you plays. pay for. It's, seniors get in free all the time. You um, never pay for a swim meet except for postseason. Yeah, that it's interesting though. That people's interest. Paid by sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's always a price. Uh, but, but I think to to Mina's point, it, and this would be outside the scope of this particular policy, but it would be worth taking a look at if we are making sure that tickets and whatnot are available for any family who qualifies through I don't know if the who the best person to handle that if it would be the coach or somebody so that families are able to go um, without that being a financial hardship for those yeah. right and you know if someone walks up to your office and says it's too high for me could they still qualify without going through all the legal paperwork something so, something for your consideration right thank you Good points. Um, so just to bring it back to this particular policy, uh, there were no specific comments on this. And was there anything else other than it moving the superintendent's office out? I think we should. so. I think it was just the superintendent. Are there other questions or comments, or is there a motion by somebody? Um, so moved. Second. So motion by Meg and a second by Mina. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. And that um, passes as well, which moves us to policy GBEBD, um, which is, uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> Online <It's> fundraising <laughs> and solicitations uh, crowdfunding. Yes. So you may remember the last time we looked at this on October 18th, it was an enormously long policy. And it had so many things in there. And I think when the policy subcommittee got together, we thought that we really just could take this thing down to bare bones. Because the one thing that we want to say to people is that we are not a district that will be using crowdfunding. Um, and this does not mean that a teacher can't use something like Sign Up Genius or um, 
one of those kinds of online things to get classroom supplies. So if you want consumables like tissues or post-it notes, that's absolutely still uh, within your purview. But things like you know GoFundMe and donors choose and that kind of stuff, that's not something that Hopkinton was interested in, in permitting teachers to use. So this is it in its most simplistic form. Uh, hats off again to the policy. It took a lot of conversation to get to. Why don't I, we just I, cut I, everything but this one yeah, paragraph? Yeah, I don't like, believe it's come here. A little too late. Yeah, right? uh, no. I did have one comment, um, and which always excites me because people are paying attention, which is that in the first sentence there, there are two is's. That doesn't sound right, but you, you know what I mean? That mm -hmm. it, crowdfunding in that perhaps taking the first is out to say crowdfunding comma defined as any online service used for the solicitation of goods, services, or money from a large number of people via the internet or other electronic network, and then all the other mm -hmm. stuff, comma, is not permitted, just to keep that second is. Good yep. catch. Very good. Yep. And while we are at it, could we say teachers may use online communication tools, or is it can? I, I think may is probably the... More appropriate. Okay. Right? And I don't think we need to bring it back just for these changes. Okay, I do want that. <laughs> right? Fair it looks like she's ambivalent on that. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> All right, so is there a motion then on this? Or, or, so, so, or, but, <laughs> one sorry, quick question. Yes. Uh, okay, great. So with regard to the cross-reference, cross I think we had a conversation mm -hmm. about linking it back to the one uh, where we had received like the HEF, uh, like policies gifts. that you have to go through a few things and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was it gifts related? Yeah, we, I think it was. We did cross reference. Yeah, so there, it's okay. There, yeah. So you have great. Mm -hmm. All right. Wait, because we've spent more time on it than I thought we would. I've noticed another punctuation <laughs> error. <laughs> it's not my fault. So the comma after a consumable classroom supplies should go after the parenthetical remark following it. Just saying. Yep. Yes, you know, you're right. Yes, absolutely. Oh, why do I have to say you're right, Professor Tyler? <laughs> All right. I'm off and rolling. Well done. Yes, right. Good night. And would you also All like right. that to say in times of extenuating circumstances? Oh, my goodness. In that second sentence? <laughs> there I mean, you go. No. I, I, it was a little <laughs> yes, bit. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Some editing. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so now we have four typographical changes to make, right? I I think We're those okay are still those. all within the purview of I passing so it tonight. I think so, too. <laughs> Excellent. So can I say I'm so moved now? You can so move. Yes. With, 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 uh, yes. 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 with those four tiny grammatical yes. changes. Yes. Okay. So second. Motion by Meg, second by Mina. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 And that is also um, so moved. And that brings us to the overnight final approval form uh, for the Hopkinton High School uh, trip that I believe is this July 2nd to the, f oh wow, it's just a nice thought to think about July when it's snowing out, sorry. <laughs> I have a quick question. Uh, are um, school committee members allowed to go as chaperones? <laughs> I was thinking the same. I actually or something think like that. Perhaps there we are should. four open lines under the chaperone box. So I, I feel <laughs> I, perhaps we should preview the trip ahead of time. Yes. Uh, the only thing that do you want to present before I make a comment? Do you have anything you wanted to say about it? <laughs> no, I was only going to say that it's a trip to Athens, Rome, and Sorrento, July 2nd to July 15th, and Charlotte Shire and Valerie von Rosenvinge. So I am a little bit like a, a broken record with this, but I do like the trips and because I know that the school is not able to provide the financial um, assistance with international tours the way we are with some things. But my understanding is that EF Tours does have an ability for students to apply for some financial assistance, financial assistance through them directly. Um, they don't have flights scheduled yet for this, it says, right? So this is a, an approximate cost per student? Or is it the, the maximum cost per student? Or does the well, I think that the, the flight scheduled yet might just be over there and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think that it might just be over there because of the dates. So they could switch back to July 1 or push out to July 16. That's the only thing that I'm thinking that means. I think that when EF gives you it's a cost, it's, it's a cost. typically that's, that's carved in stone. And in in EF, I know, does take care of those flights themselves. 
This is great. So they probably have some ideas. Sorry, I, I, I know this is the cost aspect of it, but just the fact that we are offering mm -hmm. such a thing and, you know, thinking about the flights and it's a two week program. Mm. Um, that sounds very reasonable based on, you know, the expense if you try to do this by yourself. Mm. That's where I'm coming at it from. Um, and just the fact that kids will get to go together and, you know, all the things that are listed out here. I would love to hear back from the kids once they're back. Mm. Um, this particular uh, Student Global Leadership Summit, I know they do, I think, every other year that mm. the high school runs it and that it it offers some really great leadership opportunities and things that they are able to do that they don't always have on all of the trips. All the trips that we approve, I think, are outstanding, but this one I am particularly fond of. But it would be nice to have somebody come in to talk about some of the trips afterwards. Yes, mm -hmm. I'd pictures. love to hear that yeah. from kids. Yeah. So. Absent any, if there are any questions or comments, I don't want to jump over anybody. Uh, I would <coughs> seek a motion to approve the trip for the Student Global Leadership Summit in July of 2019. So moved. So motion. Second. Motion by Meg, second by Mina. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. It is approved. And that brings us up to a opportunity for public comment. However, we are absent any public at all. Uh -huh. it, so it, with that, we can move into uh, items by consensus. Okay, so as a superintendent, I recommend that the school committee vote to approve um, the items in by <coughs> consensus um, as outlined in the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Mina, second by Meg. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. And it so carries and it moves. And I would next uh, seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay. Motion by Meg, second by me and all those in favor. Aye. Yes. Aye. And so it, we are adjourned at 9.49 p.m. Our next uh, regularly scheduled meeting is on December 6th here in the high school at 7 p.m. And we will take up some more of our budget presentations at that time. And then we also will have our uh, November 29th uh, professional development opportunity. Thank you all and have a good night. Thank you.